You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. When you need 21,000 soldiers to guard your inauguration, you're probably a president that's starting his term with a bit of a problem. And I saw Joe Biden on a video this morning. At what point does this become elder abuse? It's normal for a US president to have a smashing program for his first 100 days. I'm gonna stick my neck out and say, Joe Biden won't last 100 days. And in Britain, the paramedics are beginning to collapse under the strain. People are dying waiting for an ambulance. A taxi drew up at a British hospital this week with a dead man in the back seat. The coronavirus is killing us. How are we going to get out of this mess? And are these the men and the measures that can get us out of it. And there's no crisis that capitalism won't take advantage of. Companies in the midst of a pandemic are firing their workers, then rehiring them on lesser terms, conditions, and of course, wages. We'll be focusing on British gas, which once belonged to the British people, but of course is long privatized. And Muhammad Ali on his birthday, we're talking to a world champion that spent a fair bit of time with him back in the 1970s. It's all coming up over the next three hours with me, George Galloway, on the mother of all talk shows. My film, Killing Kelly, is coming out. You're going to see a preview of it in not a few minutes from now. Stay tuned. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. And this is London, of course, but coming to you all over the world, thanks to the wonders of the internet and sputniknews.com. If you're listening in Washington, D.C., as Donald Trump definitely is, you can do it in crystal clarity on FM 105.5 are the magic numbers there, or on AM from Burning City to Burning City, right across the United States of America. You can listen all over the world on the aforementioned sputniknews.com. But if you are one of the more than half a million people who now every single week watch as well as listen to the show, then please listen to this. If you are watching on Facebook, please right now, please share with all of your contacts, all of your friends. If you are watching on Facebook, you can do so on my own Facebook page, George Galloway Official, or on RT's multiple Facebook pages. Ditto on YouTube, either my own YouTube channel, in which case, please subscribe, and on RT's multiple YouTube channels. There is a reason why we're on so many channels, and that's because there's a guy knocking around, a Mr. Algorithm, who every single week mucks up one of our platforms. Last week, it was RT International's uh, um, uh, YouTube channel, which inexplicably fell foul of community standards ha, on YouTube, although all the other YouTube channels were working perfectly. Other weeks, it's somewhere else. So we're on all these platforms for a reason. If our service is interrupted on any one of them, please make sure that you can get to another. I myself am part of the mass migration the mass digital migration 
to Telegram. I've set up my own Telegram channel. I'll give you the coordinates of that later. But I'm doing it because, as I said last week, we cannot accept that the big tech giants have the role of judge in public speech. The reality is there are laws extant which can deal with any and all abuses of free speech. There's no need to ban free speech at all. And so I've gone to the Telegram. Uh, I've always been on it for messages, but I've now gone there. So that will be added to our quiver of uh, different arrows that we can fire into the night. We will not allow censorship to beat us. And you can help with that. Make sure that you are following us properly on all of these channels. Register yourself with all of them. Uh, we are also, of course, on Twitter. Record numbers are watching us on Twitter these days. I'm not quite sure why, because people are presumably at home and don't have to watch on a phone, but we're grateful that you are doing so and the numbers are going up and up. We're usually on Instagram, but because of coronavirus restrictions, I can't have anyone else with me in the studio. And so that has been temporarily interrupted, but we're still on Twitch, as I know a lot of you are. Now, as I said in the uh, brief introduction at the beginning of the show, if you need 21,000 soldiers guarding your inauguration, you're a president with a problem before you've even kicked the ball. And Joe Biden clearly has such a problem. I've no idea what's going to happen at the inauguration, but the state is not taking any chances. 21,000 armed soldiers in Washington, D.C., guarding the presidential inauguration. If that doesn't speak volumes to you, you are tone deaf. And I saw some pictures this week of the U.S. Senate, a place I know well, where I had my finest day so far with soldiers sleeping in the corridors. It looked like a scene from Rwanda or the Congo or some other place where the United States has been busy fomenting coups, revolutions, and governmental overthrows. I was as surprised and a little shocked as anyone at what went on in the Capitol. But I do think it's being rather overplayed. It was nothing like the coup that 60 years ago today murdered, murdered the finest African leader of them all. The greatest African leader, Patrice Lumumba, was murdered by imperialism 60 years ago. It was nothing like the scenes as uh, the Honorable Peter Hitchens has written so powerfully about today in the Mail on Sunday that took place in Kiev in the Ukraine. Again, fomented and organized, financed, armed by the United States of America. In that siege of the parliament building, the president had to flee for his life. The president was burned down and legislators were forced to sign in a law reducing Russia. Uh, Russian language from being an official language of the state to being a language of aliens. That's what you call a coup. It's as if the Americans never saw a coup before. Well, they haven't seen one in their own country before, but they've been involved in plenty around the world. I saw the presidential palace uh, in Santiago, in Chile, on 9-11, 1973 being bombed and the president being murdered by a coup fomented, organized to the tiniest detail by the United States of America. But break a few windows, trash the halls of Congress and its domestic terrorism laws and a crackdown like we've never seen before. That's all coming. And we'll be talking to Rania Kalik, who better to talk to, to discuss what's happening on the streets of the United States of America. I saw a video today of Joe Biden 
who, the kindest way I can put it, is being subject to elder abuse. This man frequently doesn't even know where he is, who he is, what he is, and he certainly doesn't know what he's going to do. He won't know what he's going to do until those that are working him from behind decide what he's going to do. And maybe they've already done that. It's traditional in the United States for people to plan a 100-day program. The president is then judged on their first 100 days. I'm really not sure that Joe Biden, poor, sleepy, creepy Joe Biden, is going to last 100 days in that job, which poses a very basic democratic question. That means we'll then have a president who nobody voted for. She was an add-on on the ticket, and within a few months, she might be the president of the most powerful country in the world. We better take a closer look at her because she's going to be an important person very, very soon. And as I said in the beginning, the coronavirus is killing us. Not that that puts off British gas. British gas, along with British Airways and a lot of other companies that we used to own as a country, have seized the opportunity of the pandemic to sack their workers and then rehire them on less wages and worse conditions. What can you say about an employer like that? Well, the British gas workers are not putting up with it. They're on strike and are refusing to go quietly into that good night. We'll be talking to uh, the regional organizer of the GMB union, the union that represents the workers in British Gas and has done a wonderful job in the public relations of this latest strike. If only every union could do it quite as well as they have. And we'll be talking on the birthday of the late and great Muhammad Ali to the undisputed British and world champion Back in the 1970s, John H. Stracy was a boxing hero of mine, champion of the world, and I'm getting to talk to him. You're getting to listen to him. And he knew Muhammad Ali well. He fought on the undercard on Ali's uh, uh, bills in uh, 1973. He had a visit from Muhammad Ali to his training camp in 1975. He knows Muhammad Ali, he knows boxing, he knows just how important this man from Louisville, Kentucky, turned out to be in the world. A man, not just a sporting icon, but a symbol of freedom everywhere around the world, whose name is still known across the planet better than almost anybody else's. And of course, we'll be talking uh, to our own Moats medic, Dr. Ranjit Bra, as the crisis of the coronavirus begins to bite ever more deeply. We once feared a thousand deaths a day from the coronavirus. We now have 1,500 a day. If we're not lucky, by the end of this month, the death toll may be 2,000 people every single day. We've already lost from the coronavirus in one year more than the total civilian deaths of British people in the entire Second World War, which lasted, of course, six years. The Blitz, the V1, the V2, they all cost us fewer people than the coronavirus has cost us. We're now well over 100,000 dead people. Do you remember people used to ring up here and ask, well, do you know anybody that's died from the coronavirus? People on Twitter, every half-wit and tinfoil hat lunatic in the country was asking, is this coronavirus a hoax? Does it really exist? Do you remember that? Well, they're not seeing it quite so often now as Everybody knows somebody 
who's died or nearly died or ended up in the emergency room in hospital with the coronavirus. One man who never made it to the emergency room was Dr. David Kelly. Dr. David Kelly was a British scientist, an arms inspector, a man who knew that Bush and Blair were lying when they said that Iraq was bristling with weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, that in 45 minutes they could launch against us. That's what the Prime Minister, Tony Blair, the man who now wants to be the coronavirus czar, who the government admits is talking to them daily about their coronavirus response, is actually a mass murderer. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong putting a mass murderer in charge of the COVID vaccine rollout? What could possibly go wrong? Tony Blair lied and a million people died. And they're still dying because the Iraq war is in a way really still going. It's still reverberating around the world. The people fanaticized by it are still looking to kill us in response. And here's some bad news for you. They'll be looking to kill our children yet unborn for another generation or more. The effects of the Bush and Blair war on Iraq will still be being felt sharply in our chests with flying glass and red hot shrapnel. That's the scale of the lies that Tony Blair and George Bush told. And because George Bush was a blithering imbecile, it fell to Tony Blair to be the traditional British liar. And they lied about the strange death of Dr. David Kelly. And my film, made with the award-winning Irish director, Sean Murray, will be out on April the 1st. And they thought they'd fooled us. They thought they might frighten us while we were making this film. They thought we couldn't get to what really happened to David Kelly, but we did. Here's a preview of my film, Killing Kelly, coming soon. You have to remember back in 2002, 2003, there was a wish by George Bush for regime change. That's what was driving him. Nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, which of course didn't exist in Iraq. So they had to construct some sort of formula, some sort of cover story, in order to persuade the British public that intervention in Iraq was right. Now David Kelly, uh, as an expert in weapons of mass destruction, knew that uh, this was untrue. He knew that there were probably no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That was a guy that could have brought down, that was a guy that could have brought down the whole system. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert uh, our probing. The Foreign Affairs Select Committee, that um, parliamentarian briefing, I think that was an indignity to him. We saw it on the news and my very first thought was shock. Um, oh my God, you know, this man is in the eye of the media hurricane. Uh, he should be protected by that at least. You've got to let on your hands, Prime Minister. Are you going to resign over this? I don't know the details of how Lord Hutton happened to be selected, but what was certainly the case is that he was the right kind of judge to use from the point of view of Downing Street and the intelligence services as well. Of the 21 days of hearing, only one half of one day was spent on discussing the forensic aspects. That is disgusting. We were given the Hutton report the day before. It was published, but actually what happened was he went too far. The events of 2003 were disgraceful ones in this country's history and it's unfinished business. Those responsible for an illegal war, those responsible for the death of David Kelly, had not been brought to justice. There's no, been no inquest into David Kelly's death. There needs to be one. We need to make sure that those who behaved 
in a reprehensible way in 2003, I finally brought a book. Now you can pre-order uh, DVDs. Uh, those who crowdfunded the film, uh, and you know who you are, uh, will of course receive uh, the rewards that they were promised and they have been lettered uh, to that effect. Uh, but if you're not one of those, you can pre-order uh, the uh, DVD. You can order uh, copies of that wonderful film poster, uh, film poster size. Uh, you can even have them signed by the director and myself. So go to uh, my website, georgegalloway.com. Uh, I've also got a shop, which I think might be a shorthand way of doing it. I'll give you the details of that once they're up on my screen. So you can pre-order your DVD and you'll be the very first to get it. Uh, I'm looking for my, uh, yeah, there it is there. There's my shop www.georgegalloway.shop if you want to pre-order your DVD or buy the film poster. And the film, as the preview said, is coming soon. We've got a poll running. Who will Donald Trump give his final pardon to in his last days as president? A, the Capitol Hill rioters. 10% of you think that that's where it will go. B, Julian Assange, 39%, but himself is favorite so far. 51% of you think that Donald Trump's final pardon will go to himself. 746 of you have voted already on that poll, and I haven't even finished speaking yet. Now, the truly wonderful Rania Kalik is joining us from the United States for a tour of what is a rather troubled horizon, Rania. Uh, I was making the point earlier, if you need 21,000 soldiers to guard your inauguration, you're not exactly off to a flying start in your presidency. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to put it. Just to correct you, I actually am not in the United States at the moment. I'm back in Lebanon watching as a spectator uh, what's happening in the U.S. Uh, since the riot at the Capitol uh, a week and a half ago. But yeah, Washington, D.C. right now uh, is an occupied zone uh, full of National Guardsmen and uh, really just a militarized presence to... I think, you know, as a show of force to scare off what they fear are more rioters to come. It looks a bit like downtown Beirut. I mean, when I saw... <laughs> Actually, downtown Beirut does not have, the, uh, is not as militarized, not even close. <laughs> so it looks uh, uh, more like, you know, what you would see the U.S. military, the presence, right? The presence of vehicles and, and soldiers and, and military fatigues. It looks like what you would see under an occupation. Yes, uh, uh, and that's... And uh, it is, it is, these, it is jarring. Uh, these optics are truly uh, horrific. Are they a bit overblown? I was making the point earlier that, unpleasant though they definitely were, the scenes on the Capitol were nothing like the coups that the United States itself has fomented in very, very recent times. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I don't think what happened was an attempted coup. I mean, people can can debate about language. Some people have made the argument that it was. I think the more proper term is insurrection. That was encouraged by the leaders of the Republican Party. I mean, it was pretty outrageous what happened, the, the symbolism of it, the imagery of it. Uh, what was really frightening was seeing a lot of these right wing, uh, a lot of these really decently organized right wing militia style groups really show what they're capable of. Uh, but at the same time, you know, had it actually been something that was better organized and planned, it, it would have gone further. They wouldn't have given up so easily and Trump wouldn't have come out after all this chaos and, you know, asked them politely to please go home. Um, but it was, I mean, it was really stunning what did happen. And there definitely needs to be an investigation uh, because, you know, either security was very lax because they don't take these right wingers seriously. As we know, in America, there's a history, uh, especially in the last couple decades, of really uh, downplaying and ignoring right wing extremism uh, while focusing, you know, all police attention on 
on left wing organizations and, of course, on Islamic uh, extremism. Uh, and that's been to our detriment as a country because these people, they organize out in the open. They organize on social media. They're pretty open and flagrant about what their plans are. They said what they were going to do before they did it, yet still, like, law enforcement didn't take it seriously. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. Uh, but that said, it wouldn't be right, yet, like you said, to compare it to a proper coup, which we've seen what that looks like in countries around the world. And typically the U.S. is, is the instigator of it. And it's extremely violent, you know, People end up dead, like we saw happen to, for example, Muammar Gaddafi uh, under the cover of NATO planes when he was lynched to death uh, on camera. So I think we need to be careful about the comparisons we're making. And, you know, I was also really, it was irritating to watch so many American mainstream reporters on uh, television make this this point over and over again. I can't believe what I'm seeing. You know, this is this is Washington, D.C., not Baghdad. Just this like really, you know, racist, exceptionalist viewpoint of like nothing bad can ever happen in America or bad things only happen in the countries that we're destroying. At the hands of America. Uh, I mean, the, the, the closest comparator uh, in terms of how recent it was uh, is the coup in Kiev, where the parliament was burned down. The president had to escape for his life. The legislators literally had guns pointed at their heads as they were forced to sign away the rights of the Russian language in Kiev. And all the liberals and pussy hats and progressives <laughs> in the United States were cheering it on. You know, George, I think that I, I would like to see in the future, and it's not going to happen, but, you know, this, I don't want to downplay the, the danger of what took place, because this was essentially, you know, these people outside the Capitol that got in were a mob. They were like a lynch mob. They had that mentality. And had they gotten their hands on members of Congress, on Democratic members of Congress, they wanted to take them hostage Actually, and they, likely they, do I, worse. No, I think they but wanted I just wanna, to kill, I wanna, I, I think they wanted they to wanted kill to the kill. Republicans. And they also wanted to kill Mike Pence and Republicans. They 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 had been told were traitors to Donald Trump. And my point to say that is that it would be nice if in the future these Republican and Democratic legislators who were fearing for their lives that day uh, could recognize and remember that feeling the next time, before the next time the U.S. tries to do that to another country, because yeah. that is the fear and terror that they inflict on governments in other countries when they cheer on mobs burning down and entering and taking hostage and killing uh, members of governments the U.S. doesn't like. I really, really would. I mean, that, that that to me, I think, is an important takeaway from what's our place. I'm sure that they're not going to think twice about it, you know, in retrospect after this. Uh, but it would be nice. And the other point I'd like to make is, you know, I think that this should be a big, you know, red alert to Democrats, because what you saw happen while it was very disorganized and chaotic, and I wouldn't call it an attempted coup, you did see the leader of the Republicans, President Donald Trump, really use right far right wing street muscle to inflict chaos and violence. Uh, and, you know, it really was a show of what you can do with those far right groups if you're able to like if you're able to organize them behind you. Donald Trump is not a very effective organizer of those people. But down the line, there could be somebody worse than Trump, who's far more effective than Trump, who comes along and is able to effectively use that really fascistic street muscle to gain and maintain power and pressure legislators. Uh, and I think Democrats really need to reflect on that, because part of the reason that those groups have grown in such numbers isn't just because of Donald Trump. It's also because the U.S. has a crashing economy right now. Neither party is doing anything to address the needs of people as they're facing complete economic destruction and ruin. They're just letting this pandemic destroy people's lives economically. And in that kind of situation, when there really isn't a strong left wing to offer people organizations to join and an under you know a framework to understand their conditions, which you don't really have in the U.S., you don't have a well-funded 
left wing that has a big platform. What you have instead is you have a very large right wing media infrastructure that is feeding these people crazy conspiracies and pushing them into the far right. And that's the danger of Democrats coming into office and not addressing the material needs of Americans, because more and more Americans are going to be susceptible to those conspiracies. And before you know it, you know, you're going to have a lot more than just the, you know, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers storming the Capitol. We'll come back to the Democrats in a minute. But you mentioned an investigation. The House uh, of Representatives didn't wait for an investigation. They already impeached uh, Donald Trump in the absence of an investigation and in uh, very quick order. Um, I feel that's a mistake. Uh, you're going to make a martyr uh, out of Donald Trump uh, in a way that might well backfire. Uh, the Senate, do you think it will convict Trump? You know, I actually don't think it was a mistake one way or another. I don't think it matters. Impeachment is just symbolic. I think what needs to happen is a proper investigation because Trump encouraged, he openly incited a violent riot to overturn or to pressure legislators to overturn election results. He did it out in the open. Uh, there's laws on the books for that. And I don't think that you're going to see Trump be prosecuted for anything. But I mean, he kind of should be. Uh, and I think what you're going to see happen is now with the Biden administration coming in in a few weeks, this is going to be forgotten and they're going to move on. Uh, and I think that that's a mistake uh, because I think what Donald Trump, what Ted Cruz, uh, what these leaders of the Republican Party did was really outrageous and they put their own colleagues in harm's way. But it's just it's, it's a fight between Democrats and Republicans. But had I done that, had I incited that kind of riot, um, I'd be in handcuffs. Yeah, sure. I mean, sure. <laughs> uh, 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 no doubt uh, about that. Now, the the whole point of impeachment, of course, is not to remove him from office because he leaves office in a few days. Uh, the point of impeachment is to stop him running again in 2024. Do you think he might run in 2024 if he can? And therefore, uh, am I right in saying that's what the impeachment is for? Uh, I do. I mean, that, that I'm not I don't, I, not sure if it would stop him from running in 2024. Yeah, but I do if think you're that Trump. If you're impeached, you can't hold any further public office. OK, well, I did. Then that would likely be one of the reasons. And I do think Trump definitely has 2024 ambitions. I mean, I've um, there's been whisperings about that. And it wouldn't surprise me. You know, Trump doesn't like to lose. He lost an election uh, and he wants to come back and show that he's a winner. Uh, so I could absolutely see Trump running again in 2024. He'll be he'll be much older in 2024. Yeah. Uh, but if he's still around, he just might do it. He's got this huge base of really loyal supporters um, who yeah, would absolutely, you know, and he runs the Republican. I mean, he is the future of the Republican Party. His, his. Yes, uh, although, although the yeah. Republican, uh, other Republican leaders uh, don't fancy that. So there may be a schism there. But before you leave us, I want to turn to the Democrats. Uh, if the Democrats were coming in with Jack Kennedy at the head or Bobby Kennedy, uh, perhaps a better uh, exemplar, uh, if, if the Democrats looked like they had the, the vivacity and the program and the determination to get a hold of the, of the spiral downwards that America is in, that would uh, maybe reassure us. But the more we, yeah. see, the more we see of <laughs> Joe Biden, the more we see a man simply not fit for the task. I mean, Joe Biden at this point is kind of just a figurehead. He's just, you know, repeating the lines he's being told to say. And what really matters is the people around him, because he's not all there. Um, and you can tell every time he speaks, right? Uh, but they, I mean, there's a lot. The U.S. is in a severe crisis right now uh, because of the pandemic, economically. Pol the polarization in the country is, I mean, not, like nothing I've ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, so, yeah, there's a huge 
Uh, there's a lot to deal with, and Joe Biden probably isn't up to the task, and he's also one of the most right-wing Democrats there is. So, you know, it remains to be seen if he's going to be able to come in and effectively lead the U.S. out of this crisis. But if he isn't able to, um, the Democrats are going to end up being blamed for everything that's gone wrong. People in two years aren't going to still be blaming Donald Trump. Uh, in four years, they're not going to still be blaming Donald Trump. So Democrats really need to get their act together. And if the past is any... Uh, is any guide, um, you know, Democrats typically end up doing the same things over and over and over again. So I'm not too confident in the Democrats being able to dig America out of this hole. They might be able to lessen the blow a little bit, but I think that we're in for a really rocky and dark uh, many years ahead as a country, unfortunately. Rania Kalik, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows and go safely, will you? Thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us. Here's some uh, comments. Georgie says he'll pardon himself. He doesn't care about anything else, just wants to accumulate more wealth. And Hartman says he should pardon Snowden and Assange, but he probably won't. And Leo says, my heart says Assange, my head says himself. And Darren says, if he pardoned Assange, that would say a lot about his character. Thomas says, why would he give himself a pardon? He's done nothing wrong. Only president in recent decades not to go to war. And Ramsey says, how do you know the president's watching? Would you care to divulge? I didn't say he was watching. I said he was listening. And Howard says, what's your opinion on the impeachment? Will Trump be canned? Well, I doubt it. You need a two-thirds majority in the Senate. That means... Uh, you need 66 senators. Uh, the Republicans have 50. The Democrats have 50. I doubt they can get to 66. Because uh, if the point of Republicans defecting would be to finish Trump as a candidate in 2024, it would be a suicide mission because Trump's base and his 75 million voters are a very big proportion of them, would never vote for that senator again. That senator would be primaried in the uh, Republican Party primaries and be defeated. And if they were somehow to rig the primary, they would be defeated in the actual election. Um, and secondly, what's the point in stopping Trump standing in 2024? He'll be very old. He's very, very unfit. Not nearly as healthy as he told us he was. Chances of him being a candidate in 2024 are obviously in the hands of God, but uh, I wouldn't put uh, money on that. But somebody that Trump picks, like his son or his daughter or uh, somebody else who is perhaps better at it than him, but still with the same mindset, the same political program and so on, that would still happen. And Trump would be the martyr. He'd be the man who was cheated out of the election and then impeached so that they uh, could never have to face him again in an election. I myth myself think that would be a mistake. And I don't think 16 Republican senators will do it. And Farhad says it's been predicted that Trump will be the last president of the United States. Well, that prediction's already uh, defunct because Biden will be the president in just a few days' time. And Mark says it won't be his last days as president. Believe me, Biden will never set foot in the White House. <laughs> I imagine Julian Assange will be pardoned too. Mark, give us, a, give us a call, will you? So that I can ask you why, how uh, Biden will never set foot in the White House. This is the QAnon uh, multi-dimensional chest. There's always something going to turn up to save Donald Trump. I'm afraid that ball is burst. So who will Trump give his final pardon to in his last days as president? The Capitol Hill rioters, Julian Assange, or himself. You can vote now 
on my Twitter account, at George Galloway. Let me take a two-minute break. Count them. Radio Sputnik. Just when you thought it was safe to eat out to help out, the virus has mutated. You need to gather your team of elites to take down this new variant. Help us, UK government. Select your character. Wishy, wishy, I made dreams come true. What a Hancock. Oh, I don't know. Boo, Joe, Jojo. Let's get back to normality. Track and trace the virus. It didn't work. You've wasted billions of pounds. Oh, I don't know. What a Hancock ran away. Bojo Jojo used confusion. Go back, forward, back a bit. Stay indoors. Don't stay indoors. The virus is confused, aren't we all? The R number is increasing. Wishy Rishi used throw money at it. Wishy Rishi, I made dreams come true. It didn't work. Only your Tory friends made money. The virus is spreading faster. The Tories used clap for heroes. But it didn't boost the NHS. It's the virus's turn. It used unprecedented times. Oh no, you're infected and now have the worst cases in Europe. Bojo Jojo used it'll all end in tears. But it's far too late. Bojo Jojo used vaccine. That's 93% effective. You've stopped the R number rising. I've only got a bloody done it. Blah, 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 blah. Now to wait 12 more weeks until the next one. Lockdown! You can play this game in any room in your home. Masks and brain cells aren't included. Sputnik has been launched to give you a closer look at everything happening in the world. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. The world is our classroom and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. On this day in 1942, a young boy was born. Cassius Clay was called then. He would go on as Muhammad Ali to become the undisputed heavyweight champion, not just in the division, but of all time. He would become the undisputed greatest of all time. He would become the most famous sportsman in the whole world of all time. He would become the most famous man in the world, at least in his time. Sadly, he's no longer with us. We'd be celebrating his 79th birthday if he was. But another undisputed champion of the world was John H. Stracy, who I absolutely loved in the ring and therefore am honored to welcome onto the mother of all talk shows. John, thanks for joining us. You knew Muhammad Ali. How great is that? Um, first... uh, I, uh, he was incredible, George. What a man he was. He defied everything. He defied, you know, the boxing was, was just a part of what he did. He was such a great person uh, other than the boxing. And he got everyone to be friendly, all nice, you know. And even though boxing's a hard sport, he made everyone love it and love him. And it, it, he was just a, a wonderful man. There'll never be another Muhammad Ali as long as we live. I can, I can assure you that. Yeah, and yeah, it didn't start that way. I mean, uh, I, I, I remember my father getting me out of bed for the first Liston fight when 
when uh, Muhammad Ali won the championship for the first time. And I can tell you that where we lived in a hard, all white, working class area in Scotland, my father, yes. God rest him, and me were the only people rooting for Ali to win. Uh, people oh, at that yeah. time hated Ali. They thought he was big headed, big mouthed, and black. Uh, yeah. And that was not a persona that people were used to in those days. No, but do you know what started that? Because he was Cassius Clay and he was like the, the young lad coming up. He wanted to show off his skills. He wanted to show the world who he was. When he went up to Muhammad Ali, there was the more softer person, the more nice person. And he tried to be nice with everybody, show the whole world. He didn't want wars. He didn't want any trouble. And he showed that side of it as well. Although he was a boxer and he had to hurt people, outside the ring, he was the most wonderful man. Very, very um, soft. He, he wasn't a big head in any way. He was just a, a real character. And, you know, sadly missed, I can assure you, by all boxers in this world, I can assure you that. Now, uh, you were uh, a welterweight, fast. Uh, he was fast beyond belief for a heavyweight, wasn't he? Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, he, he used to do that thing, didn't he? He used to say, you know, watch how quick I am. I can throw five punches. Then he stood there and said, do you want to see him again? <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's what he used to do. But, you know, I had a great experience with him because I first met him in 1973. Uh, in Las Vegas when I boxed on the Muhammad Ali Joe Bugner bill. And the bill was called the British are coming. And also a young lad who was on there, former champion be to, to become champion was John Conti. Wow. And yeah. And the bill uh, was called the British are coming. That was the name of the bill. And during, when we got there, we met Muhammad Ali. I met Muhammad Ali. I was in awe, absolutely awe of him. Um, and then what happened, how I met him was, was a, a great thing. I've got in, in, in Caesar's Palace, we're doing our training for the fight. And uh, Ali's moving around there doing his shadow boxing. I jumped in the ring. And the first thing you do, George, is you always tap your person who's in the ring with you. You know, it's like a gesture. Yeah. So he was leaning over the ropes talking to the press. So what I did, I tapped him on, the, uh, in, you know, on his waist. But he didn't take the notice. He just he just stood there. He didn't look look round. And so I was doing my shadow box. And then I did it again. And he still didn't take the notice. But what happened after that, as he turned to, you know, just to move away, he stood right on my foot. And let me tell you, I, I thought it was broken. And as I went down, he grabbed me, swept me up, and he was clinging to me, holding me. And he was going to me, are you all right? Are you all right? And I thought, I don't believe this. First time meeting Ali, he's holding me around the waist. <laughs> so I thought, I'm not going to say I'm all right because I want him to keep holding me. So he's going, are you all right? I'm going, no, no, it really hurts. Oh, it really hurts. <laughs> And after about 35, 40 seconds, he's let go and we just looked at each other and laughed. And from then, whenever I saw him, he always gave me a smile and, you know, because it, it, it was just wonderful. Um, and I just want to say, he boxed Joe Bugner. Um, he lost to Joe Bugner. Uh, John Conti won that night and I won as well. And, and it was called The British Are Coming and we won 2-1. Well, and I, it was in I, I, Las I wish, Vegas. I, I wish it the was. British were coming could be uh, reassembled. Uh, neither the British scene nor the American scene is what it was, uh, in my no. view. Uh, the, 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 those days, uh, champions like you, like Ali, were, were bigger somehow. Well, in a way, yes. I mean, it was more... It, in them days, you didn't have the Sky TV or anything where, you know, people pay and, and there's only a certain amount watched. When we was boxing, it was television all the way. So you had millions watch you. So you become more popular. And yeah. Ali, obviously, he used to be shown at the cinema, which they don't do much now. I don't no. think they'd hardly do any of that now. No. It's all pay-per-view. I, 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 saw, him, I he, saw him fight Frazier in the cinema. I think it was in Blackpool, actually, again in the middle of the night because of the time difference. I saw him fight Foreman in a cinema. 
but that's all gone now. In fact, cinemas are all gone. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're, certainly with boxing. I mean, whether they come back or not, I don't know. But boxing, you know, it, it's a pay-per-view now. I mean, people, it goes all over the world now. When I boxed for the world title, it was just sort of America, Mexico, Britain. It wasn't as huge as it is, um, as it should be, really. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, pay-per-view now, you can get uh, two, bil- 2 million views, whereas... You know, in the boxing, it was a lot better because you didn't pay, but you could have 25 million watching. So yeah, there was a big exactly. difference then. I think that's why you're more popular as well. I still uh, love boxing. I still stand up for boxing. But it's got a lot of critics now, John. What would you say to the critics? Oh, I, I, I would say that, yeah. It, it, it's sort of... When, I mean, the only thing I can say, look, like when I box... You was always friendly with your opponent. You never did silly things to him. You know, you never got away in and then you'd like spit at him or you'd punch him like we've seen so many times in the last few years. We was more respectful until we got in a ring and that's when you sorted it out. Um, but now it's they're trying to goad each other before the fight. And uh, to me, it, it's not discipline enough. They should be told not to do that. It should be friendly. And then fight. That's that's what boxing's about. Because afterwards, you're always friends. That's the one thing you become. Uh, that's an interesting observation. Um, did you become friends with everybody you fought, or were there any exceptions? No, virtually every single one. Um, I was friendly with everyone I boxed. Um, and you become more friendlier because you've fought each other. You, you're more respectful. I mean, Palomino, who beat me, me and him, we, we speak a lot, we talk a lot. I've seen him many, many times since I boxed him. People like Jose Naples, who I beat in Mexico City, we, we were talking a lot and friendly and, and stuff like that. So, and Hedgeman Lewis, who I defended too. Uh, funnily enough, when Ali came in Quaglino's, I'll tell you a quick story about that. Yeah. Um, Muhammad Ali came to Quaglino's in London in uh, March of 1976 when I was defending the world title. And um, he came along to, uh, they was making the fight with him and Richard Dunn. So he came and gate crashed my uh, boxing, you know, my, my training. And it was marvellous because when he came up, he said, I still remember treading on your foot. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> he good. still remembered that. So, you know, he was, like I say, it was great then. Boxing now, you know, it's good, but it's not great. No, it's I not. So. I mean, and, you know, I've got the money to pay per, pay-per-view, but I, I don't generally do it because I'm not... I don't feel attached to any of the fighters uh, now that no. I used to. I used to feel really attached to you. I felt really attached yeah. to Ali. Uh, and, I, yeah. you know, I would have done more than cross the road uh, to pay to see yeah. uh, you yeah, and I, Ali I and, and other fighters. But I don't feel close in any way to today's crop of no. fighters. No, and the other thing as well, George, you've got to remember, it's all changed. I mean, where, you know, when I was champion, there was probably about 12 or 14. Now there's 68 world champions. <laughs> and, you know, when you're, when you're as a champion at the same time as Muhammad Ali, like I was, it's just, like, incredible. And all that's changed today now because, you know, you can fight for any title today and not the real main one. That is the problem. Yeah, and, and these will never be unified now. I mean, you were the undisputed champion of the yeah. world, but yeah. that very seldom happens now. Yeah, you don't, you don't see that. I've, I've got the Ring Magazine belt, which is the undisputed, and that is very, very seldom given out now but it used to be given out when you was a proper world champion. Now they don't really know which ones to give them out to, so a lot of them are held back. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it's, it's so different now. What do you do now? What do you do now with your time, John? Are you still in the game in any way? Uh, not really, no. I mean, I'm, I'm doing uh, – I'm actually in the amateur side of it. I'd like to have been in the professional side of it, but – I didn't really do that. You know, I should have done because my experience in boxing is second to none. I mean, I, you know, and, and you know, the funny thing, I'm 70 years of age now and I don't know where that's gone. 
<laughs> we know, no one knows where it's gone. Mm. But, you know, I train most days. I do my training. And I can still do things that I did when I was 25, 30. So, uh, I, you know, I really should have gone back into it and uh, trained a, a lot of lads. But I, I suppose there's still no saying I couldn't do it. No. But, uh, you know, 70 now, it's, it's sort of uh, a little bit older than I, I would want to be. Well, we missed those five uh, shots you just gave there. Maybe you could do it again. <laughs> John H. Tracy, um, champion of uh, the world. Thanks for joining us on I, the Mother just of World Talk Shows. Yeah, go on. I just want to say that I've got me uh, at the end of the year and there's a lot of things going to be in it. You know, when I when I was a kid with a craze, um, you're talking about Muhammad Ali. There's loads and loads of things that uh, is going to be in the book. What's it and, called? Um, What's know, it called? Well, we don't know yet. I haven't got the name yet. Okay. Um, but, and it's, but it's we'll, coming we'll out this year. It, hopefully it should be this year. Yeah, I mean, because of the lockdown, um, it, it's, you know, it's hard to get it written by uh, someone who's doing it. And, you, you know, I can't go around there and see him and all things like that. Yeah. So it's, it's like a bit awkward. But it, it will be done by the, certainly by the end of the year, hopefully. Well, I'll, you know, tell, you what, I'll, I'll tell you what, John, uh, when it's published, we'll have you back on the show and we'll go through oh, the book. Yeah. Thanks very much oh, that'd be great, for George. joining us. I really consider it an honour uh, to have My interviewed pleasure. you. Thank you very much, uh, John H. Tracy, undisputed champion of the world, talking about the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, whose birthday it is. Who will Trump give his final pardon to in his last days as president. Over a thousand of you have voted. Capitol Hill rioters, 10%. Julian Assange, 38%. Himself, 52%. You can still vote for the best part of the next hour. Uh, I might be able to squeeze in a call before I go to the news. Can I do that, Chris? Um, yeah, let's uh, squeeze in a call uh, because I don't normally get uh, around to it in the first hour. This is Nikki in Paris. And Nikki is Hello. there now. Yes, Nikki, welcome. Hi, hi, George. Uh, Happy New Year. Happy even New though Year. So Lovely <laughs> to hear from you in Paris. <laughs> hi. Um, I just wanted to talk about the bail application and um, those uh, the evidence that was presented by the prosecutor, which uh, appears quite clearly to have been uh, misleading. Uh, the prosecutor led evidence that there were only three prisoners that were COVID positive uh, at the time of the application, uh, whereas uh, a few of us had FOIs that give us numbers like 52 to 59 to 68. I got an FOI response saying that there were 68 prisoners that were COVID positive on the on the date of the application on the 6th of January. Now, so the prosecutor was lying about that. Well, uh, there are questions there about those three prisoners. I mean, how do we get? I I sent another letter to Lord Buckland uh, asking him how they got these marvelous acrobatics. Uh, from, uh, you know, from the, how did they flatten the curve so quickly within a month and 13 days? Uh, because, uh, as I said, there were a few FOIs uh, that give us But I, I've numbers. seen answers like yours, uh, giving a figure of more than 60. Uh, but it's hard to believe that a prosecutor would lie in the high court, isn't it? Yes, well, he's not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Because the prosecutor not. Is, is meant to be uh, uh, neutral and has higher duties to the court than uh, than other lawyers. Um, but the the other thing I wanted to mention is that Lord Buckland, being the Secretary of State uh, uh, for Justice, has the duty and the power to release him if uh, Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which is incorporated in the UK Human Rights Act, Article 3 being the prohibition on torture and degrading in human treatment, uh, Lord Buckland now has uh, clearly, I think, the duty and the power to release him because he doesn't seem to be able to stop the torture. Just so, uh, uh, I, need to, to I need to go to the news now, Nikki. Just a quick answer, please. Yes. Have you given up hope that Donald Trump will drop the charges and pardon Julian? 
I think that he won't pardon him. I think the timeline was uh, very carefully planned. If we look at the date of the verdict, 4th of January, the um, uh, the date for the last day for appealing uh, the case by the prosecutors, the 19th, one day before the inauguration of Biden. I think what they're planning is to pave the way for Biden to say, well, we'll just let the courts decide. I, I don't think Donald will do anything about pardoning okay. Assange. Okay, I've got yeah. to go. Because okay. I've got to have the news from okay. Jamie Lowe. Okay. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Sputnik News. All 50 US states are on high alert for possible violence in the run-up to the presidential inauguration ceremony of Joe Biden on Wednesday, with at least 20,000 National Guard troops deployed to guard Washington DC and the Capitol building. Details are also starting to emerge about the raft of executive orders planned by Biden as soon as he takes office this week. The new president will issue decrees to reverse President Trump's travel bans and rejoin the Paris Climate Accord on his first day, according to US media reports. The president-elect is also expected to focus on reunited families separated at the US-Mexico border and to issue mandates on COVID-19 and mask wearing. Biden will be inaugurated on Wednesday. Donald Trump, though, has said he will not attend. People in England are being vaccinated four times faster than the new cases of COVID-19 are being detected, NHS England's chief executive has said. Sir Simon Stevens says 140 people a minute were now being given the jab, usually the first dose of two. But he said the NHS had never been in a more precarious position, with more than 75% COVID patients than at the April peak. Stephen said some hospitals would open for vaccinations 24 hours a day, seven days a week, on a trial basis in the next 10 days, adding that England was on course to deliver 1.5 million doses this week. Scotland has delivered a total of more than 224,000 first doses. Wales has given over 126,000, and Northern Ireland nearly 180. Although Scotland and Wales do not report figures at the weekend. Health officials have described a COVID outbreak on Barra in the Western Isles of Scotland as serious and escalating after a further 17 cases were identified. There are now more than 110 people in isolation after 27 positive cases with islanders being urged to stay at home. The number in isolation represents about a tenth of the island's total population. Two people have already been taken off the island for further treatment after testing positive. All close contacts of those who've tested positive are being offered tests to try and limit the spread of the virus on the island, which has limited medical resources. The UK government is planning new laws to protect statues in England from being removed on a whim or at the behest of a baying mob, Community Secretary Robert Jenrick has said. He said generations old monuments should be considered thoughtfully and the legislation would require planning permission for any changes and a minister would be given the final veto. It will be revealed in Parliament tomorrow morning. Several Australian Open tennis players have expressed frustration at being confined to their hotel rooms for two weeks after people on their flights tested positive for coronavirus. At least three players said they might not have gone to the tournament if the rules had been made clear to them. Organisers said the rules were clear and the event would proceed as planned. Dozens of players are now in isolation ahead of the competition in Melbourne, which begins on the 8th of February. Two women judges working for the Afghan Supreme Court have been shot dead. They were killed by unidentified gunmen on their way to work today. The deaths are the latest in a string of assassinations targeting journalists, activists and other political figures. The violence comes as President Donald Trump continues a drawdown of US troops in the country, with only 2,500 left. The women were shot dead in the early morning ambush, which also saw their driver wounded. 
Uganda's main opposition presidential candidate, Bobby Wine, says his life is being threatened following Thursday's election, which saw Ureni Museveni win a sixth elected term. The singer-turned-politician said he rejected the results with, as he said, the contempt they deserve. He alleged that there had been a lot of irregularities, but Museveni called it Uganda's fairest ever vote. Campaigning has been marred by violence in which dozens of people have died. A team of Nepalese Sherpas has made history by scaling the world's second highest mountain in winter. The 10 climbers reached the summit of Pakistan's K2 on Saturday, more than 20 years after the first winter attempt to reach the 8,611 metre summit. As they stepped onto the summit, they all sang the Nepalese national anthem. Four international teams had arrived about a month ago to scale the mountain, but the Nepalese were the only ones to succeed so far. Previously, nobody had managed to get higher than 7,700 150 metres in the winter, a record set almost two decades ago. But on Saturday, the weather conditions were fair enough for the team to push ahead. It came after it was revealed a Spanish mountaineer, Sergei Mignote, died while also attempting to reach the summit. And finally, a Hollywood star has put up a reward of $20,000 for information leading to identifying the person or people responsible for writing Trump in capitals on the back of a manatee in Florida. Dave Bautista, one of the stars of Guardians of the Galaxy, announced the reward on his Twitter account. He tweeted, if there's not already a reward for the arrest and conviction of the low-life scummy maggots that did this, I'll throw in $20,000 and I promise there will be bonuses to that reward, he said. The manatee, a large sea cow, was discovered on January the 10th in Florida's Homosa River with the president's name scraped on its back. It's not clear what was used to mark the animal. A local wildlife center has already announced a $5,000 reward for information. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the Untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. You can still vote on my Twitter feed. Uh, who will Trump give his final pardon to in his last days? The Capitol Hill rioters, Julian Assange, or himself? And himself is well ahead. Uh, at the moment. You've got until nine o'clock or so uh, to vote on that. Naveed says on uh, Muhammad Ali, moving sports to pay-per-view or Sky Sports has had an adverse effect on grassroots sport. Lots still can't afford to watch, so there are no role models, aspiration figures for youngsters. And David says, happy birthday, Muhammad Ali, one of the greatest men of the 20th century. He will mostly be remembered for his great fight with George Foreman, but his greatest fight of all was outside the ring, and he won that too, what a man. And Manuela says, boxing is entertainment now, it's not for the sport. Will says, John H. Tracy looks good for 70, he does indeed. And Dan says, I lived in an apartment owned by Muhammad Ali. We spoke to him all the time. Great guy. Dan, give us a call and tell us about it. And Joanne says, I never liked boxing, with the exception of Muhammad Ali. He was special. Indeed, he was. Now, uh, as I said, there are uh, some times uh, that uh, it's a good time to smuggle out bad news. Uh, there are some times when it's a good time to sack your workers and rehire them on lesser conditions and, of course, pay. But the employer doesn't always have to stand up to a determined group of workers like the British gas engineers, whose GMB trade union have done an exemplary job of bringing to the public's attention the gross unfairness, immorality, of such a practice. Hazel Nolan is a regional organizer at the GMB union and is involved heavily in the dispute. Hazel, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, just describe, if you will, uh, what British Gas did and what the workers did in response. 
Well, George, um, these are workers who are um, key workers. They're the workers who went into people's homes who they knew had COVID last year in order to keep them warm. And while they were doing that, their employer was busy behind the scenes plotting how to slash their terms and conditions. Um, basically, what's after happening in British Gas is that the company are using a Section 188 fire and rehire legislation uh, to effectively sack all the workers, thousands of them, en masse. So you could have been working for British Gas for 33 years and you won't receive redundancy, you'll just get sacked unless you sign up to their um, lower terms and conditions. And what's really important to point out is that these workers aren't going out to fight for more pay, they're just trying to preserve what they do have. And I think if COVID has shown us anything this year, it's how important our family, family time is. Um, and so what's taking place now is the biggest gas strike since the 1970s. Um, Essentially, when you are confronted with a bully, you have two options. You can either lie down and take it or you can stand up and fight. And that's what these workers are doing. Well, well done to them and well done to you and the GMB for organising them and letting the public know. I mean, in a quite novel way, uh, you've, uh, you've rightly, uh, as it were, packaged the strikers as people, not just numbers. So it's not just there's X thousand uh, on the street, uh, on strike, it's Joe who's on strike. And he's got a wife and he's got children. And this is what the company is trying to do to him. Uh, that was a, a very good way uh, that the union uh, reacted. Tell us. Well, George, um, I obviously work for the union. Um, I'm the trade union bureaucrat. But the union is our members. It's not, it's not people like me. That is what is a union. It's the space that exists between those workers um, and, and it's in their solidarity. And solidarity builds the union. The union doesn't build solidarity, as Rosa Luxemburg once said. And, uh, and that's true. I think it's the coming together of those workers. And it is their emotional stories that people care about. I think that when we have disputes, too often we get lost behind a wave of facts and figures that get thrown about and, and, and argued. And what cuts through is these workers' emotional stories. We put out a call for strike volunteers just before Christmas, and we had over a 1,000 of our members come back saying that they wanted to be a strike organiser. So we spent all of our Christmas, um, myself and, and a few others, gave it up to, to run a series of strike schools with the members, and they have taken that and they have run with it. And I think that's what really does cut through. We, you know, uh, we're also organising this strike. It's the biggest strike taking place in the UK at the moment. Um, but it's also a strike that's taking place during effectively, uh, you know, a national crisis with COVID. Um, so we made the picket line, the picket lines, their vans. We made the placards, their mobile phone or their computer screen. And we've made social media our megaphone. And my God, those workers have stood up and they've spoken and they're being heard because they're choosing to speak with one voice. And it's, you know, I'm just in awe of them and inspired by the way they have, they have stood up for themselves. And when they stand up for themselves, they stand up for each other. And it is, the, it is that sharing of stories that cuts through to people. You know, I mean, uh, there was a leaked video of the Centrica management uh, that said that they consulted experts. And it's nice to know they've got money to splash out on experts, but not enough money to pay their workforce. Um, but the expert advice apparently was, to, was for them to keep quiet. And no wonder, because how can you possibly argue against families standing up, um, asking for family time and fighting for that? I think regardless of where you work in the economy, um, that's something that every, that's going to touch everybody. Yeah, this is not the first time that the GMB has taken on uh, British gas uh, before your time. Uh, um, I can't remember how many decades ago now uh, you confronted the GMB confronted the head of British Gas with a pig, a real live pig, uh, because he was acting like a real live pig at the trough while the workers were left out. Uh, what's going to happen next? Are the companies showing any signs of backing down? Well, we have another strike um, organised for, for Wednesday, George, um, and then a series of, of different strike dates after that. Um, we're trying to put as much power into our members' hands as possible because we believe in bottom-up uh, grassroots organising in GMB. And uh, we actually put out an email to our members last week and we said to them, how many days do you want to go out on? We've called it an extra five days after the initial five days. So that's 10 days. After that, what is it that you want to do? 
and 83% of our members wrote back and said they wanted to go out for additional five days. So that's 15 days. Um, so that shows you the, the, the strength of feeling that there is amongst the membership to fight this. Whether there's a strike or not, or whether those go ahead, is actually not down to the GMB. It's going to be down to the Centrica board, um, whether or not they want to put their egos above their, their workforce and above their customers. Um, because all they need to do is get back around the negotiation table with us and lift this fire and rehire fresh to the workforce and negotiate in good faith with the union. Um, and whether or not that's going to be done, well, we'll see. But our lines are holding strong on the picket and we believe our members are in this for the long haul. Well, stay on the line, if you would, Hazel. Uh, I've got Gordon, uh, who works for Scottish Gas, on the line. Uh, and uh, you may be able to help me with that. Uh, Gordon, uh, welcome uh, to the show. What would you like to say? Uh, well, I would just like to thank uh, Hazel, your guest, uh, first and foremost, for all the great work and that she's doing with the GMB. Uh, also, uh, anybody within the GMB, all our reps... Uh, all my co-workers and all our other staff members that are out in strike at this time for such an important uh, cause. Uh, because I, I'd just like to say as well that I think it's a scandal that this uh, story hasn't been given the coverage it deserves on terrestrial television in the UK. Yeah, well, no we've got COVID. a much bigger audience than terrestrial uh, television. There's a million people. There's so a, they were a million people listening to you. Uh, right now, uh, Gordon. We've lost Hazel, I think. Uh, but uh, tell us how the company have uh, have affected you. Well, I mean, I've been a Scottish gas worker, George, for 37 years. This is the only job I've known. I left uh, the school and went into Scottish gas as an engineer. And I'll tell you something now. I've, I've gave the best parts of my life to this company. I've had two operations in each of my arms to continue working as an engineer in the field. And the way they treat their workers over the last 10 years is nothing but shocking. Everything's just targets, targets, targets. And it's just it's like dealing with your, your, your next in command uh, boss. Uh, they just it's just well, they just do what they're told for on high for the, these people at the top. And all they're interested in is making a dividend. You know, this company... As profitable, this company made money through COVID times, and during that time, our leaders encouraged us to do our bit for every cause out there. We were working with the Trussell Trust, we were doing uh, food banks, we were doing donations, we were doing deliveries during time we were furloughed, and we weren't doing that. We were out helping uh, our customers. We were working in homes where the people actually had COVID right at the beginning. And during this time, our leadership were hatching this plan to push through inferior contracts by blackmailing us with fire and rehire. And, I mean, just nobody wants to know about the, the fact that we're out there doing this. I mean, I'm great. I hope you've got a big audience, and I hope people listen to this, because this is not just about uh, the dispute. This is about life stories. This is, I mean, the count of people have said what, how this affects their life and how it affects their family. I mean, just before Christmas, the bullying of staff to take up these new contracts, it was just constantly, oh, this is your last chance to sign, this is your last chance to sign for this, to get this, to get that. And, I mean, we've held out and we'll stand strong and, and we'll win this because we've got to win this because fire and rehire should be illegal, but it's not... But we've, we must stick together and we must win this because it can't be allowed to happen. That was a wonderful call, Gordon. Uh, not just the best of the night, maybe the best of any night. Uh, and uh, we can feel uh, the anguish uh, in your call uh, that the workers feel. Last word to you, Hazel. Well, I just said I'm proud of Gordon and the thousands and thousands of workers like Gordon. Um, you know, what we've been saying uh, the whole way through this is that and regardless of whether you're working in British Gas or any other company, actually, they win when they make you feel small and alone. And you win as a worker when you realise that you're not. And it's by coming together, that's where the power in the union lies. And these workers have, have shown that. I think they're a credit to the whole trade union movement. And I hope they inspire other people who are uh, under the cosh from their, from their um, employers to stand up. There is an alternative. There is a way to fight back. Um, and that's what they're doing. 
and they can at least know, regardless of, of anything else, that they have the integrity of having stood up for their own principles. Wonderful, Hazel, and congratulations to the GMB and solidarity with Gordon in West Scotland and all the thousands of British gas workers that are being treated so badly by a highly profitable employer. Thanks, all of you, you. for your contribution. Let me take a 60-second break. Count them. Radio Sputnik. OK, first question. Do you regret voting against school meals? I'm glad we were able to put the current system in place. But do you regret it? Uh, well, we have got the system, and I'm glad that we have got it, and we are able to put that system in place. Can you just answer the question, please? Well, that's not how we do things at the moment. Look, just say yes or no. Glad. Okay. Let's see if we can get you to answer a straight question. What day is it today? That's a great, great question. I'm glad that you've asked it. It's Sunday. Uh, I'll put it into my own words. Thank you very much. It's a day in the week. It's not Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. And it's definitely not the day or after Monday. So some would say the end of the week or the beginning, sort of. And I'm glad of that. <laughs> Don't get wrapped up in all that nonsense. Keep listening to the mother of all talk shows. Sputnik has been launched to give you a closer look at everything happening in the world. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to call us, in the UK, the number is 02077982255. That's 02077982255. If you're in the US, it's 001757744480. Or you can tweet us, of course, at George Galloway, at RTUK News, preferably both of us. Uh, now, this is where I look back at the week the ruins and successes of history in the seven days which shaped our world. This is the week. Sixty years ago, uh, as I said earlier, the Congolese independence leader and first prime minister of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, was murdered in a CIA-provoked coup. The CIA director, Alan Dulles, described the coup as an urgent and prime objective. And so the Congo was handed over to the US-backed dictator Mobuto Seso Seko and more than 30 years of misery and barbarism uh, then unfolded. But actually, uh, Mobuto had a great time. He became the greatest thief of the 20th century. Can you imagine that? Mobuto may have personally stolen a hundred billion dollars worth of corruption uh, from the country. He called the country Zaire. It was his own personal fiefdom. He danced on the grave of Patrice Lumumba. He repressed all opposition and he looted the richest country in Africa. In fact, potentially one of the richest countries in the entire world. How different would the Congo have been? How different would Africa have been? How different would the world have been if the United States, Belgium, and Britain, and Britain had not organized the overthrow of and the murder of the greatest of all African leaders, Patrice Lumumba. It was also on this day in 1991 when Operation Desert Storm began inspired by one of the biggest lies in history, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Gulf War allies sent hundreds of planes on bombing raids into Iraq, with Saddam Hussein remaining defiant. In 1977, Gary Gilmore, the convicted murderer, was executed by firing squad 
in the Utah State Prison in Salt Lake City. The novelist Norman Mailer wrote a book about it, The Executioner's Song. Two people received Gilmore's corneas within hours of his death, which inspired a song by punk band The Adverts called Gary Gilmore's Eyes. Gilmore's final words were immortalized on T-shirts with Let's Do It written on them. This was the week in 1943 when the Soviet army broke the 18-month-long siege of Leningrad by Nazi Germany, opening a narrow land corridor through the siege was not fully lifted until a year later. And the Labour leader, Hugh Gateskill, died in this week in 1963 after a sudden deterioration in his heart condition. And just a day later, the opening of the Iraq war in 1991, Iraq retaliated by attacking Tel Aviv and Haifa with Scud missiles. It was also uh, the week in 1980 that Pink Floyd's album The Wall hit number one in the United States. Last week's guest, Roger Waters, had rather a lot to do with that. What an album, what a man. If you haven't seen my interview with Roger Waters, please look it up on YouTube now. Uh, the only daughter of uh, Prime Minister Nehru uh, of India, Indira Gandhi, became the first woman Prime Minister of India in this week in 1966. Now, of course, Joe Biden will be sworn in despite one of our correspondents earlier saying that he'll never set foot in the White House, uh, Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th US president on Wednesday. And uh, January 20th is the traditional day for presidential inaugurations. In 1961, the Democrat John F. Kennedy was sworn in as the youngest ever elected president of the United States and the only Roman Catholic until now. Ronald Reagan in 1981 became the 40th president of the United States. Barack Obama in 2009 became the 44th president of the United States of America with Donald Trump succeeding him. A little earlier in 1950, British writer George Orwell died after a three year battle against TB. His novel, 1984, wasn't meant to be a manual. It was meant to be a piece of fiction. And in fact, it didn't go nearly far enough when you see the world that has now come to pass. And in 1978, the Bee Gees album, Saturday Night Fever, went to number one in the US charts and stayed there for 24 weeks. I watched a Sky Arts documentary uh, just the other night on the Bee Gees. It's really well worth seeing. Rather sad ending, of course, because Big Barry Gibb is the last one standing and very sad he is about it. But in their day, and certainly back in 1978, the Bee Gees album Saturday Night Fever was really quite something. In fact, no less than five of the tracks from that album were in the US Billboard Top 10. It was also the week in 1967 that US President Richard Nixon appeared on national television to announce peace with honor in Vietnam. Didn't turn out that way. The last American troops left Vietnam on the 29th of March, 1973. Apart from the 58,000 of them who came back in boxes. The country was finally reunited in 1975 when local fighters of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese troops took control of Saigon and renamed it after the leader of the whole Vietnamese people, Ho Chi Minh. And finally, does it seem like just a year ago this week that China locked down the city of Wuhan and its 11 million people in their effort to control COVID-19 with a then official death toll of 17 and over 500 people ill. How times change. Not here though. The Chinese managed to sort it out. Back then, a year ago, the US and Britain still haven't. That's it. Another inglorious week in our history. Bruce in Derby 
is a British Gas customer. Go ahead, Bruce. Hello, George. All right, mate. Uh, I was um, encouraged to, to ring in because one of the topics of your show was how British Gas are treating their employees. Yeah. And I just wanted to say they're not only bullying their staff, they're bullying their customers too. I've been a British Gas customer for about eight years, never missed a payment, always paid my bills. I had no choice of who my supplier was because that was controlled by my landlord. Now, I lost my job because of COVID. I couldn't afford to live there anymore. So I had to cancel the payments, cancel the, 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 you know, the standing order because I had to find money for my new, my new residence. Once I moved, I contacted them to let them know where I was living and uh, to compare the final meter readings. We agreed what the meter, me, final meter readings were. They gave me a bill and I paid. So as far as I was concerned, we were done, right? I paid up what I owed. I've now had another bill sent to me, which is an estimated bill. And I've had a text message sent to me telling me if I don't pay it, they're going to send uh, send it to a debt collection agency, and they're going to there may be added costs and court costs, and it's like they're chasing me like a pariah. I've never missed a payment, so why why do they treat their customers this way? Well, for That's the same reason for the same reason that they treat their employees that way, uh, they are a cutthroat capitalist company that we used to all own uh, when it was in public ownership. Uh, you'll remember, was it Sid? Tell Sid you can buy British <laughs> gas. Uh, and, uh, and now it's in the hands of, uh, of people, pe people who don't give a toss about the rights and standards uh, of, uh, of the workforce or the customer base. Uh, they've got uh, um, a hugely advantageous position because they're called British Gas. Uh, people want to uh, give, the, give their business to a big, solid, well-established, once respectable company. And these people are trashing uh, the respectability, the reputation of the company, well, British Gas. By the way, if they're listening, they're welcome to phone up the show and put their <laughs> side of the story, but they won't. Hey, George, George. The Last name word British to you, gas. Bruce. Last word to you. The name British Gas is a misnomer because it, it purports to be a British company. They're not a British company. No. They're, they're a capitalist company and they don't care about us. And if you stay with British Gas, you're not, you're not investing in Britain. You're just lining the pockets of thieves. Well, all I want to say is they don't really care about us. And you've made that point very clear, Bruce, in Derby. Let's hear from Graham in Aberdeen. Go ahead, Graham. Hello, George. Thanks very much for taking my call. Welcome. This is my first show, and if I'm a wee bit nervous, please excuse me. No, my call take is your about time. Julian, yeah, my call is about Julian Assange. I am concerned about his situation more so than before the recent court ruling that prevented his extradition. The joy was short-lived as America was refused permission, but didn't get their way in having Julian extradited to the United States. But it was because of concerns of his health, particularly his mental health, because the judge effectively ruled against Julian and Ethling, but stopped short his extradition. My concern is that during the appeal, if the Americans do appeal, they were given 10 days. Is that right, George? Uh, they were given, I think, 14 days, uh, and they said they were going to appeal. I don't know if they have yet. Well, I'm very concerned about this, because because the, the judge ruled in Ethling apart from the extradition, my concern is that all the Americans have to do, and I hope you can alleviate my concerns here, George, is to, if they can assure the appeal that doctors, nurses, and psychiatrists will be looking after Julian. They'll do everything to look after his mental health before any trial in the States. My concern is that's all they have to do 
to get Julian in that plane to America. Can you alleviate my fear, George? Uh, I, I don't think that they'll win that case. I think that Julian will not be uh, extradited. I think if Judge Barista ruled against the United States, then any judge would do so, uh, mm -hmm. because she made it very clear throughout the entire proceedings, her unalloyed contempt for Julian Assange and her slavish obeisance to the arguments of the United States. But the American prison system and injustice system is in such low order uh, that if she wouldn't extradite him, I don't think anyone will. So uh, the best solution is for Trump to drop the whole thing uh, before Wednesday. Uh, the second best thing is for Biden's incoming administration to drop the whole thing. Uh, the third best position is for Julian to be uh, released on bail with strict bail conditions, no doubt. Uh, tags and so on, so that he can at least weigh out what might be a long period uh, of uh, appeal process. But I, I now do not believe that Julian will be extradited to the United States. That's not the end of the story for the reasons you gave. Uh, mm -hmm. that what about if the next person so accused is in robust mental health? Say me, for example. The United States asked for my uh, extradition uh, because I speak against them and reveal their crimes. Um, maybe I won't be able uh, to persuade a judge that my mental health is such that I should not be extradited. Or what about any other journalist or any other broadcaster or any other campaigner? Uh, that's the worrying thing, Graham. Last word to you. Well, you've completed my education there, George, to be very honest with you. I can never see you, a man of your intense inner strength, being robust. But, uh, but, that, but you made a very, very vital point there, George. I would like to say one quick word, that I support your alliance for unity. I've even sent you a small donation of £20. Thank you, I've been, te I've been telling Liam Kerr about you. I've also been told, I've also told people like Andrew Bowie, the MP for West Aberdeen, to listen to your show. I'm trying to get people... I'm trying to raise awareness of the Alliance for Unity to get people on there, but the concern I've heard from Leon Kerr and uh, what was the, the woman down in your part of the world, Dumfries and Gallery, she, she challenged Jackson Carlo yeah. for the Tory leadership. What was her? Michelle I, Ballantyne. I, yes, Michelle. I contacted her as well. They were both concerned, George, and you've got to leave it. You've got, you've got to win over these people. They are concerned that you split the unionist vote. That's their concern. I'm trying to get these people to work alongside yeah. you. Well, look, uh, Graham, uh, Graham I, uh, I'm not legally uh, bound to, but I think morally and ethically I'm yes. bound to not proselytize for sure, my sure. political uh, um, forces uh, on mm -hmm. this platform. Uh, but I do try and, mm -hmm. uh, and do so on Twitter mm -hmm. unremittingly, and I'll, I'll continue to do that. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your call, Graham. Another Scotsman, Gerard in Kilwinning. Go ahead, Gerard. Hi, George. Thanks for taking my call, mate. Another great show, as always. Thank um, you. I, th I thought your interview with Rania earlier on was great. Um, can I just say, uh, just make it very clear, I have got absolutely no time for these Trump supporters, these conspiracy theorists. No, they were a basket Apple of Hill. deplorables, right enough. Oh, they, they absolutely are. I mean, they, they treat him as if he's Julius Caesar, some kind of god emperor who can do no wrong. Um, the, the only thing I want to say, George, and I found it quite distasteful, was... I really felt there was a lot of kind of people who would consider themselves to be liberal or progressive who were actually almost disappointed that more of these people didn't get shot by the police. So, I almost uh, felt like one of the BBC uh, uh, presenters uh, was briefly before taking it down uh, demanding that they be shot. I know, and listen, I, I don't think there's any doubt. Had it been Black Lives Matter, then it would have been a harsher response. Sure. However, I think we have to bear in mind a lot of these cops who are on the front line actually deserve praise, but they're not, you know, shooting. I think that a lot of these cops are black, and, and as we said, this is a white supremacist mob. They would have lynched some of those cops had they actually started shooting because they didn't have enough bullets to defend themselves for a start. But are we really in a position where just because 
even if we completely disagree with somebody who might be totally white supremacist and totally right wing, do we want to see blood on the streets? Do we actually want to see them get shot? Well, that's, because... uh, that is the point, Gerard, and very well made. Uh, either the rulers of America want to calm things down and narrow the divides between people, or they don't. If they don't, then go on doing what they are doing. Impeachment yeah. and bans and wiping people off social media uh, and so on. If they want to widen the divide and sharpen the divide, then go on. Be my guest. Yeah. Uh, but if they, if they don't, they'll take the opposite uh, path. Last word to you, Gerard. I, I think you're right, George. And, and as you said earlier on, you know, when, when it happens in Ukraine, Hong Kong, Venezuela, whatever, it's a great thing. It's a great thing for democracy. But when it happens on the doorstep of Nancy Pelosi or Mike Pence, oh, it's terrible. You know, we, we must defend the capital from these uh, insurrectionists. They're such hypocrites. And, I'm, you know, I'm not glad it happens, but maybe no, it's a wake up call. Hypocrites is the right word. I've just seen videos of of uh, Nancy Pelosi calling for an uprising around the <laughs> country uh, against Trump's first election. The Democrats Thanks. organized a four-year insurrection, legal, uh, media, political insurrection against Trump on the bogus claim that it was the Russians what done it, uh, that it was Absolutely. Vladimir Putin that put... Donald Trump in the, in, the, in the White House. I just saw a video of a A-list Hollywood guys calling on the Electoral College in 2016 to overturn the election result, not to vote as they were bound to vote by how the vote went in their state. Uh, so capital H hypocrites, Gerard, uh, all the way. Thanks for the call. Mandy asks via email, uh, Dear Moats team, please can you let me know if it's possible to watch old episodes of your programme? It is indeed. You can view all episodes at moats.tv slash watch. And uh, lots of other comments, pardon me, on, uh, on British gas, but I need to uh, take a break, but give you the numbers first. If you're in the UK, it's 02077982255. If you're in the US, it's 001757744480. Or you can tweet us, of course, at George Galloway at RTUK News. One minute break, count it. Call me. Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Don't bring up a false name. Come on air. Call me and let's have this matter out. Mm, let's get ready to rumble! How, how do you have know, the nerve to tell people to Brexit if, you have not, if you're not but, telling them but that's, the repercussion? That's 2016's argument, Michael. I'm no longer arguing with you about the merits of Brexit. I'm arguing with you about democracy, about the right of the majority to have their decision, their vote implemented. This match will get red hot. Not have a referendum. No, let them I, have a referendum. Let them sort it out amongst themselves. I want a referendum. Robert, I want yes, a referendum. Let me put that in capital letters. If you think this year of 2020, which is shaping up already to be an anus miserableus for the SNP, if you think this is your year, go ahead. Come on. Let's have it out. It's on. But look, look, George, it's not as simple as that. Right? Have you seen the documentary about Cambridge Analytica and the people oh. who work there? Have you looked at the I know global nothing about impact? that. I'm, I'm not interested but, but in precisely, them. But precisely. I'm, I'm, inter I'm, I'm not interested in them, Bruce. Because it's all a red herring. Just like Russiagate was a but, red but, herring. But you're up. Do you only want to hear voices that agree with you? Because if you do, you're not clever enough to be at this open university of the airwaves. In fact, you need to go back to remedial and learn something about what democracy and freedom of speech actually mean. George Galloway.
and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Now, because we are fair and balanced, I should give you the response from Centrica, uh, the gas company. Uh, we are operating in an incredibly competitive market, and British gas has lost too many jobs and too many customers over recent years. We can't continue like this. We need to take action to modernize and refocus the company in line with what our customers need now, not what they needed 20 years ago. Our pay for engineers will remain the highest in the sector, but we need to get productivity back to where it used to be. And for some, we need to increase the working week from 37 to 40 hours. We're not changing base pay or pensions, and we will reward increased productivity through additional bonuses. 83% of our employees have already accepted the new terms that we, black, no, that we uh, encourage them uh, to do, including the majority of our engineers. Our changes are ultimately to protect and create jobs for the future. Well, you haven't persuaded me and you haven't persuaded your own workforce or I suspect a lot of your loyal customers. Centrica, listen and wise up. Now, a 92-year-old man was arrested outside the Julian Assange bail hearing, hitherto uh, described and discussed. And I've got him on the show. He's Eric Levy. He's 92 years young, and he was huckled by the police. He's actually one of the most loyal, dare I say, indefatigable campaigners for the freedom of Julian Assange. He deserves a medal not being arrested. Eric, welcome indeed as a hero onto this show. Tell the audience what happened. I accept your welcome, uh, hero. Well, I think the unsung heroes are the ones, uh, and um, I appreciate what George Galloway you have done. Uh, yes, it was, uh, you made so many noble attempts uh, taking a bus to Iraq and uh, then uh, uh, supporting all of us who went there, and uh, it was important to uh, to know what we should all be doing. Uh, I, perhaps uh, I can quote uh, a leader, <laughs> a great leader, favorite of uh, my friend Claudia Jones, uh, the spiritual mother of the Notting Hill Carnivals, uh, who was a communist in the United States, jailed there for a year, and uh, got it. Uh, I think she contracted tuberculosis and a heart condition, but she's a wonderful fighter for freedom. She came to Britain because uh, she was expelled from the United States. And uh, uh, after that, of course, she had to find a country. And uh, the, the president of um, uh, Trinidad, where she was, uh, she was born, uh, didn't want her. It seemed he even banned his own book, which was about uh, the need for slavery uh, to be abolished. Uh, well, economic slavery to be abolished. And Claudia came to Britain, and one her greatest political hero, when she went to join uh, to Japan for a conference banning nuclear weapons. Uh, she passed over China, and she said, Mao Zedong of uh, China is my big hero. And uh, I think it's important to, uh, to, to stress this also. So, uh, yes, the, the voice of the people, Julian Assange here, and in the case of Mao Zedong, he issued twice in the same year, calling on all the world's peoples to support the struggle of the African Americans for full equality. So I think it's very commendable, and uh, I, I did appreciate what I learned from uh, uh, Claudia Jones when uh, I'd been in Africa for two years, uh, supporting the independence struggle in Guinea Conakry, which is uh, which is a French republic, uh, French yeah, uh, French colony. Sorry, <laughs> naturally became a republic, and uh, the other one stood up to De Gaulle's referendum, the only one. And uh, when I returned to um, 
Britain. Uh, I was uh, welcomed by Claudia Jones, and I stayed with her for two years. So I do appreciate everything she did. And towards the end of her life, she went to China. I mentioned on the way to Japan, conference banning nuclear weapons, uh, uh, calling for the ban on nuclear weapons. And uh, uh, she did... Uh, uh, well, see, I would say I'll call her my political mentor, putting the finishing touches to uh, whatever knowledge I might have. Uh, and uh, well, you've got plenty of knowledge, Eric, and uh, but uh, theory without practice is blind. And, Good for you. Uh, yeah. and you have been an activist of the very first rank and for many decades. Uh, why have you? done so much physical work for Julian Assange in particular? Uh, because he is one of the great people who speaks for all of us. Um, and uh, I think that we, we, need a, we need a spokesperson, somebody speak out against these injustices. If uh, ordinary people like me get, well, first, we won't get time on TV anyway. We're not celebrities. And those who are, well, one can question uh, whether they are thinking of their careers first, and perhaps if they do say anything about peace, uh, it's not really what uh, they should be doing. They should subordinate their own interests to the interests of the masses, of the people. And, uh, of course, I often mention the great Paul Robeson. I hope people remember him. Oh, Paul he's, the, he's the first uh, entry in our Hall of Fame. Eric, ah, good the for you. very good number for you. one entry. Good for you. Yes, his wonderful, most most beautiful singing voice. And if you doubt that, you can listen to his records. But listen not only to the songs of the African American people that are so often political allegories. You know, so didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? And why not every man? Well, of course, every man, every woman. And when I say man, every time I think of the great women who supported us. So when I fight for the rights of Julian Assange to be free. I say also, I honor the great Chelsea Manning. And I think it's very important. I remember the statement, I think, again, of the Chinese uh, um, throughout the world, that women hold up half the sky. So we've got to be for the rights of black people, for equality, and of course, women's equality with men. This is very important. Perhaps I could also say something about, you mentioned age, young and old. Well, we've got to honor the young people. I remember this uh, uh, documentary which featured uh, uh, my, my friend Claudia Jones to some extent. And the song is by Judy Collins, you know, wonderful singer. Freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing. It doesn't come down like the summer rain. Freedom, freedom must be, uh, is a new... Um, a great thing. Uh, you've got to work for it, honor it, fight for it, sometimes die for it. And every generation has got to win it again. 30, a generation in sociology is 30 years. Uh, so it's important for the young people. So every generation. And that's why I think so much uh, will depend on the, the uh, contributions made by the young people. And it's great that they've done this. I know that they were hoping with a labor government headed by um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn and other people that we would get something decent. Uh, it didn't happen, but uh, I think it was a good opportunity that was missed by perhaps many of us on the left too. We didn't see perhaps importance. Uh, so. so what happened uh, outside the bail hearing, Eric? Outside the bail, uh, the building, uh, well, as, as far as I know, since I was the first to be removed, I can't see what happened, but I'm hearing uh, from my friends that they too were forced to leave. And uh, bail should be granted, certainly. I mean, if Julian remains in jail, then the magistrate, Baritzer, who talked about not having extradition to the United States because He'd had, the, she said, the intellect and the determination to commit suicide. Is she concerned about his life so much? I mean, if he did die, he would have been a martyr and would have said uh, a lot would have come out of that. But uh, you prefer to, n not so much to die for your freedom as to live for it because then you carry on. So uh, when she said that, it was clear to me that she didn't want him to die in the United States. But then 
saying he, he should remain in jail in Britain and be denied bail means that she didn't mind if he died in Britain. <laughs> no, it would, it, well, should it make any difference? That's why I think that uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot about that, uh, that kind of rationalization that uh, we should dismiss, you know, that... Uh, what did uh, if you were in silence, what, dead or alive? <laughs> what, what did the police say to you as they led you away? Well, they acted as if they were doing me a favor. They said, "Well, uh, you're here, and uh, you might get hurt, and so forth." I said, "Well, we always get our chances. If there's another war of aggression, and uh, if uh, the country we are attacking f would fight back, which Iraq and uh, Libya and even Afghanistan couldn't do, but." Remember North Korea, too. That's what stopped Trump, because uh, when Trump said, oh, I'm left not lifting the sanctions against you, the North Koreans said, we're continuing to test the weapons, and right now we can perhaps hit Guam, occupied by the U.S., and maybe also the western coasts of uh, California, okay, where I lived, you know, for a long time. And I felt, well, if, if that would... That's what stopped uh, people like Trump, who are chauvinists, who don't mind what happens to other country. And then then uh, I think it's it's welcome. It's not that I I like uh, violence of violence of the victim of aggression, which is a Vietnamese pointed out, is not to be equated with the violence of the aggressor. It's not because I like it. I would prefer if uh, there were no need for that. But unfortunately, uh, very, very often with the aggressors, I mean, if you hadn't uh, uh, fought back uh, in the case of Hitler, uh, what would have happened? Give me liberty, give me death, said the great Patrick Henry in the United States. So, uh, yes, I think it's uh, something we have to do, uh, you know. Are you looking forward uh, with any, Sorry. are you looking forward with any confidence at all to the presidency of Joe Biden? Uh, <laughs> I know, well, I'm not the only one. Nobody seems to know much about him. I haven't heard anything uh, that I would call favorable about him, but perhaps not yet unfavorable, although I think that uh, uh, he, he did not oppose the, uh, the policies of the um, uh, United States and British imperialism in well, in, well, whenever I don't know what time he 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 came to uh, to hear about uh, the foreign policy of the United States or the domestic policy, I'm not sure what he would even say about African Americans. What he would say about women's rights, <laughs> about the working class generally, I don't know. But uh, let's perhaps give him the benefit of the doubt in that he he is the president, or he's going to be. And, <laughs> Few it's days going to be now. in a few days, yes. How many presidents then have you lived through? Excuse me? How many, How many? presidents have you lived through? <laughs> Who was the president when you were born? Well, yeah, I did live through, and I would say the, Amer the United States' last great president is Franklin D. Roosevelt, FDR. Yes, that, that was a fine man. You, uh, before that, you have to go back, possibly to Grant, so I understood he drank too much, but there were the eight, eight years of democracy after the Civil War, you know, so where black people came into their own, were allowed to participate. Uh, uh, it's what we call the re re Reconstruction here, uh, period in the United States. But of course, the great Abraham Lincoln before that. And uh, But you were well, born under I mean, FDR, yeah. right? <laughs> Sorry? You were born under FDR. Uh, yes, under FDR, uh, 1928. Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> the, the Depression, 1929. Yeah. I'll tell, you, I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you that Joe Biden ain't no FDR. Uh, I've got to go to the news, but let's just include the clip of you under arrest because it will live forever. Eric Levy, thank you for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Just resist, that's it. You know. I said I could talk like Muhammad Ali, I can't fight like him. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I'm done something there. Thank you, Eric, for joining us. That clip will live forever. The day when London's finest in the Metropolitan Police arrested a 92-year-old man. Uh, well, look, the news is uh, coming up shortly, but I wanted to get some more of these comments in. Mick says, British gas, horrible capitalists, greedy swine, well done, Hazel. And Frank says, 
When they start screwing professional people like gas fitters, you know that everyone else is well screwed. And Ben says, Pimlico plumbers are doing the same. Anyone refusing the vaccine will be sacked. Max says, thank you, Hazel, for being so great. Carol says, solidarity with the workers. I'm a customer and vulnerable with British gas, and I'm being bullied by them. And Ali says, British Airways did the same thing a while back. We can't allow this to continue to happen. Now, the poll is now closed. The results are in. And 51% of you think that Donald Trump is going to pardon himself. 38% uh, of you think that he will pardon Julian Assange. Only 11 that he will pardon the Capitol Hill rioters. After the news, it's the one and only Moats Medic, Dr. Ranjit Brar, and your calls for most of the final hour. So stay tuned and listen up to the news with Jamie Lowe. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com. Sputnik News. All 50 US states are on high alert for possible violence in the run up to the presidential inauguration ceremony of Joe Biden on Wednesday, with at least 20,000 National Guard troops deployed to guard Washington, D.C. and the Capitol building. Details are also starting to emerge about the raft of executive orders planned by Biden as soon as he takes office this week. The new president will issue decrees to reverse President Trump's travel bans and rejoin the Paris Climate Accord on his first day, according to US media reports. The president-elect is also expected to focus on reunited families separated at the US-Mexico border and to issue mandates on COVID-19 and mask wearing. Biden will be inaugurated on Wednesday. Donald Trump, though, has said he will not attend. People in England are being vaccinated four times faster than the new cases of COVID-19 are being detected, NHS England's chief executive has said. Sir Simon Stevens says 140 people a minute were now being given the jab, usually the first dose of two. But he said the NHS had never been in a more precarious position with more than 75% COVID patients than at the April peak. Stephen said some hospitals would open for vaccinations 24 hours a day, seven days a week on a trial basis in the next 10 days, adding that England was on course to deliver 1.5 million doses this week. Scotland has delivered a total of more than 224,000 first doses. Wales has given over 126,000 and Northern Ireland nearly 180. Although Scotland and Wales do not report figures at the weekend. Health officials have described a COVID outbreak on Barra in the Western Isles of Scotland as serious and escalating after a further 17 cases were identified. There are now more than 110 people in isolation after 27 positive cases with islanders being urged to stay at home. The number in isolation represents about a tenth of the island's total population. Two people have already been taken off the island for further treatment after testing positive. All close contacts of those who've tested positive are being offered tests to try and limit the spread of the virus on the island, which has limited medical resources. The UK government is planning new laws to protect statues in England from being removed on a whim or at the behest of a baying mob, community secretary Robert Jenrick has said. He said generations old monuments should be considered thoughtfully and the legislation would require planning permission for any changes and a minister would be given the final veto. It will be revealed in Parliament tomorrow morning. Several Australian Open tennis players have expressed frustration at being confined to their hotel rooms for two weeks after people on their flights tested positive for coronavirus. At least three players said they might not have gone to the tournament if the rules had been made clear to them. Organisers said the rules were clear and the event would proceed as planned. Dozens of players are now in isolation ahead of the competition in Melbourne, which begins on the 8th of February. 
Two women judges working for the Afghan Supreme Court have been shot dead. They were killed by unidentified gunmen on their way to work today. The deaths are the latest in a string of assassinations targeting journalists, activists and other political figures. The violence comes as President Donald Trump continues a drawdown of US troops in the country, with only 2,500 left. The women were shot dead in the early morning ambush, which also saw their driver wounded. Uganda's main opposition presidential candidate, Bobby Wine, says his life is being threatened following Thursday's election, which saw Ureni Museveni win a sixth elected term. The singer-turned-politician said he rejected the results with, as he said, the contempt they deserve. He alleged that there had been a lot of irregularities, but Museveni called it Uganda's fairest ever vote. Campaigning has been marred by violence in which dozens of people have died. A team of Nepalese Sherpas has made history by scaling the world's second highest mountain in winter. The 10 climbers reached the summit of Pakistan's K2 on Saturday, more than 20 years after the first winter attempt to reach the 8,611-metre summit. As they stepped onto the summit, they all sang the Nepalese national anthem. Four international teams had arrived about a month ago to scale the mountain, but the Nepalese were the only ones to succeed so far. Previously, nobody had managed to get higher than 7,700 150 metres in the winter, a record set almost two decades ago. But on Saturday, the weather conditions were fair enough for the team to push ahead. It came after it was revealed a Spanish mountaineer, Sergei Mignote, died while also attempting to reach the summit. And finally, a Hollywood star has put up a reward of $20,000 for information leading to identifying the person or people responsible for writing Trump in capitals on the back of a manatee in Florida. Dave Bautista, one of the stars of Guardians of the Galaxy, announced the reward on his Twitter account. He tweeted, if there's not already a reward for the arrest and conviction of the low-life scummy maggots that did this, I'll throw in $20,000 and I promise there will be bonuses to that reward, he said. The manatee, a large sea cow, was discovered on January the 10th in Florida's Homosa River with the president's name scraped on its back. It's not clear what was used to mark the animal. A local wildlife center has already announced a $5,000 reward for information. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. <laughs>
goes from bad to worse. So we better analyze it. Dr. Ranjit Brar, doctor, physician, surgeon, welcome back. It's always such bad news we have to talk about, Ranjit, but there's no getting around it. It's been a very, very bad week, but maybe there is some good news. I'd like to test it with you. Having made a total disaster of everything else, the rollout of the vaccine, at least in England, seems to be going well. It's certainly going five times better than it is in Germany. And it's not often you can say that about British performance compared to Germany. So let's start with that. Uh, where did it all go right? <laughs> Uh, good to be back with you, George. Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to say it's all going right. I really hope that it is. Um, uh, so far, we were, as you know, one of the first to approve the uh, novel uh, BioNTech vaccine. Uh, we pretty much used up our stock of that for the time being. Um, and the question as to whether people are getting their second doses or not will be one that I think we need to watch very carefully. My father had his first dose and then has received a letter saying that they'd like to delay his second dose. I've had my second dose. But I know people who have even had their second dose, healthcare workers, and have tested positive. So it's not all uh, good news. And a, and a fairly substantial number, though, they've all had mild infections. So you know, it, we mustn't forget that we had interim uh, data on the Pfizer-BioNTech um, vaccine. It was basically uh, published in trials on a press release. I'm still very optimistic that it will have a big impact uh, on, on transmission rates ultimately, along with, as you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which had lower efficacy rates in any case. But again, both uh, vaccines, uh, the AstraZeneca, interestingly, on its initial trial, um, they, they thought about having a single dose um, uh, but found it to be far less efficacious than a double dose and rapidly discarded that idea, um, whereas the Pfizer-BioNTech has no data whatsoever to back up the concept of a single dose. So this is something that in the background is worrying me. Um, but yes, in terms of the, just the absolute numbers, I believe we've got to close to 4 million people who have had at least one dose of the vaccine. As, as we've commented before, um, that would just about be uh, the number of over 80-year-olds in the country. And you talk about the number of over 65-year-olds, you're talking much closer to 13 million. Um, but in fact, the, 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 the particular um, population groups targeted are going to be the over 70 year olds, the clinically vulnerable uh, nursing, co uh, nursing home residents and healthcare workers. So we're way off that, but uh, that, I mean, the, the government have been fairly uh, consistent in their messaging that they're trying to get uh, that proportion of the population vaccinated within essentially six weeks from now. Uh, and it's certainly true that uh, the vaccine initiative has accelerated massively, George. Why then have the Europeans, I mean, the European Union, we were told that sky, uh, the planes would fall out of the sky, we wouldn't be able to get our medicine, and so on. The European Union's solidarity, they're all fighting like ferrets in a sack, and actually France uh, is even worse than Germany. In fact, considerably worse than Germany in the numbers that they have uh, been able to vaccinate. Why do you think the European Union has done so badly? Yeah, difficult to say, George. I haven't been following the, the, the ins and outs of the, uh, of the politics between their countries on them squabbling over the vaccine, perhaps as closely as you have. I have seen that they've started uh, in, in the eastern part of the, of the EU uh, tentatively, surreptitiously, quietly to give uh, the green light for in fact, the Chinese vaccine for uh, Coronavac, which is the Sinovac vaccine, which is now being rolled out in Serbia and Hungary, um, and probably um, in S uh, Montenegro, some of the smaller um, uh, countries of the East Eastern Europe. But in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, obviously, is essentially a German company um, uh, with a bit of Dutch input. So you would imagine that they would have strong access to the supplies. But the exact, uh, I haven't followed exactly where... Well, the, it's one, the, uh, when we reached 5%, uh, the Germans were still on 1%, and the French were on 0.45%. Yeah, they certainly have problem, uh, George, because they're, they're, uh, Germany, which who was initially relatively spared, has been having a very tough time uh, with this second wave, as has France. Uh, both of them not quite as bad numbers in terms of cases per million. Uh, UK by by the um, not going by the uh, uh, 
uh, if you like, the excess mortality, but just the case proven positive has already breached 90,000. And therefore, our numbers per million is, is, is 1,300 per million. It's an enormous figure. But France is not far behind and Germany not, not awfully far behind. So they, they will have a problem if they don't accelerate uh, their program because, as we've seen, our ability to apply the, the health measures and the simple quarantine measures necessary to control the virus uh, without uh, vaccination have essentially fallen flat on their face. There have been 400,000 uh, COVID deaths in the EU, George. Wow. Uh, now, uh, coming back here to Britain, the number of dead, you know, the, I think the government manipulated in the early part of the crisis to keep the daily death toll down below a thousand because they knew uh, the symbolic gravity of that. And so there was no day in which officially 1,000 people were listed as dead. But now we're over 1,500 a day. It's getting really very bad out there, isn't it, Doctor? I think that's true, George. I think when we go back retrospectively and look at the true figures, uh, there were, as, as we commented on once before, actually a period of perhaps 21 days, perhaps three weeks in the first wave, where there were over 1,000 deaths a day. We know that these figures tend to go up rather than down over a period of time as the figures are carefully collated and they're almost always, I'm afraid, revised upwards. But this week's been particularly bad. We've uh, looking at just for the past one week, uh, we've had 7,722, so getting on for 8,000 deaths from coronavirus in the UK in a single week. And as you say, on Wednesday, there's 1,564 reported deaths within a single day. So really in, enormous figures. And far away, away, I still have some people are saying, where's the flu gone? This is essentially just like a flu season. We always have, you know, um, over, uh, under capacity and, and, and waiting, uh, queues waiting outside our, our aid. That is true. There has been a decrease in the bed base periodically that causes a systematic and perennial bed crisis within our health system. But then met with this challenge, this challenge is far in excess of anything like that. Um, perhaps we're seeing as many as 980 to 1,000 ITU admissions Per week, sadly, many people, the over 70s, are, are faring extremely poorly. Very few are surviving. So these are the relatively young end of the spectrum of the people who are presenting to hospital, uh, who are, are getting into ITU. Uh, and though we're desperately trying to increase our capacity on the hoof, closing down theatres, putting people into theatres, putting people in wards and, and fitting them out as kind of ad hoc ITUs. We know that the London has tripled its ITU, the Royal London Hospital in East London has tripled its ITU capacity. It's not alone in doing so. Many hospitals in that region are two thirds full of patients with coronavirus. So really there's a, there's a huge demand currently on the system, which the system, uh, our National Health Service, is not able to meet. And very, very sadly, but perhaps predictably, you know, we, our health service is really being overwhelmed by this pandemic, George. How many uh, people are dying in the last 12 months more than would die in a normal year? Do you know that, doctor? Uh, I don't know the absolute numbers, but the rate of ITU admission uh, I was looking at recently, and, and in the very worst years, we're talking about three and a half um, per million of the population to ITU, whereas so far in this wave of the coronavirus, we're looking at about 18, 19 um, per million of the population. So it's a, you know, it's an order of magnitude higher, um, which is in accordance with everything we know about it, uh, the coronavirus. Um, it, it's just a different, it's an entirely different entity. So you can't really adequately con compare them. And the thing that's so very different that we said again and again is this viral pneumonia, this pneumonitis, um, which really is a, is a killer. And those patients who develop it, it's extremely resistant to treatment and can cause sudden deterioration, people's saturations, in addition to these thromboembolic events, uh, including pulmonary embolisms, ischemic legs, ischemic gut, all kinds of things. Um, of that nature. And these two uh, aspects of the coronavirus make it a very different entity uh, to flu, George. Is the lockdown, such as it is, still, in, it's still highly partial? People are still having to go to work. People are still flying in in airplanes, uh, oftentimes from places that are as badly affected as us. But insofar as we have a lockdown now, I think we can say it's a much stricter lockdown than there was uh, even just a few weeks ago. Is it working? Um, 
that there are the first signs, and that's to me the most hopeful thing. There are the first signs that the numbers are are decreasing. But if we look at the number of cases, test proven, you know, positive cases, this one week was still 340,000, um, uh, whereas last week it was more like 450,000. So there's been a significant drop from last week to this week in cases. There'll be a lag in that. The hospital admissions are still rising. Hospital number of deaths are still rising. So I mean, there's the beginning that these very blunt and crude measures are starting to turn the corner. But it's it, it's stricter in some senses and less strict in others. More people will be going to work. More people will be uh, going to school. You know, you can't blame people for the conditions in which they live. We have, if anything, a more impoverished and a less resilient population than we did in the first wave. In that, a lot of people have been uh, without work and without, you know, means to adequately sustain themselves for a great period of time. And we know that, apart from the fact that yes, we do have a new variant. Uh, interesting, by the way, to note uh, Dominic Raab. Uh, and making announcements that it was very wrong of uh, people around the world to stigmatise Britain by calling this the British or English variant, uh, when that had been precisely what he and his government and others were doing uh, at the beginning of this pandemic. But but that aside, we have seen a new variant, yes. But what we've really seen is that the this pandemic, this this new wave, has been driven by the fact that the, a, a large number, millions of working class Britons, have been forced to carry on working, carry on earning a living, carry on going about their business. Um, and haven't had the luxury of isolating if they have been tested positive, and many, of course, will not have been tested. So, you know, th those are the conditions that we have created for our population. They are unable to look after their health, first and foremost. They're in conditions where they are essentially forced by the need for short-term wages just in order to feed uh, them and clothe themselves and house themselves. Uh, to flout the very restrictions that the government is placing on them. No point placing restrictions that people are unable to meet. It's a bit like King Canute ordering back the tide. It will have no effect, George. Uh, David in Bulgaria is on the line, Doctor. Let's hear what he has to say. David, welcome. Hello, George. Um, last time we spoke, I think it was episode 57, when I told you about the uh, way the restrictions were handled in Bulgaria. Yeah. With, um, the police uh, put it up, uh, blockages across the road, stopping people. Um, I won't go into that in great detail now, but as from July, the government brought out the passenger locator form. Um, I filled in the passenger locator form, and uh, on arrival at Luton Airport, I asked people, well, who do I give it to? I was told, throw it in the bin. No one's interested. This happened again in August and in September. Um, in November, I decided I'm not even going to bother filling the form in. Uh, December, I couldn't travel because Tony Blair decided to shut Luton Airport just for two days, which disrupted my flight, but didn't do anything about the COVID pandemic. And then I come over in January, I did fill in the passenger locator form, and there was an official, I don't know whether it was border control or the police, but he was stopping everyone and asking if they had filled the form in. I showed him my form, and that's all he did, was look at it. They didn't take the form off me. There was no filing system. I then went into isolation, and I sat back waiting for the knock on the door for the police to come. Nobody came. I've now returned to Bulgaria. I've had a notice put on my gate that I am in isolation until the 24th of January. The police come round. The mayor comes round. They're constantly monitoring that I do not go out the house. In the UK, it is just an absolute joke. Very powerful, also, David. Uh, doctor, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's um, a, p a pertinent observation, essentially. Um, we've said throughout this pandemic, uh, it's a pandemic that came uh, not from our shores, but from abroad. It's been, there, there were lots and lots of papers that showed essentially there were multiple points of entry of the virus, principally from southern and central Europe. Uh, we, we, we knew that. Uh, and there were hundreds and thousands of individuals who brought this pandemic with us, many super spread, uh, spreading events. So it was possible. Actually, when China notified the world, if we'd taken it seriously, realised what was going to happen and wanted to, of course, we could have closed borders and, and had very strict monitoring and we wouldn't have had this problem. It was entirely avoidable. Um, not saying that any of that's desirable, that you want to be there, but it's certainly possible through simple measures to stop it happening. 
Uh, we're very deliberately not taking that choice. And as far as I can see, there have been flights pouring into our country from the from the world's hot uh, coronavirus hotspots um, all year. Uh, and that's sure. not really changed. Uh, now, the, again, yeah, they're now closing corridors in uh, in January of 2021, having kept them open from January 2020. Thanks, uh, David, in Bulgaria. Here's another call, Doctor. Andy in Preston. Go ahead, Andy. Hello, folks. Um, I have a government guidance document on the possession right now stating, uh, quote, as of 19, 19th of March 2020, COVID-19 is no longer considered to be a high-consequence infectious disease, brackets, HCID, brackets, in the UK, unquote. How can this be so if we have been living in a pandemic since March? Well, obviously it isn't so. Uh, doctor, is that worth uh, answering? Well, it is, George, because this, uh, this perturbed me as well when I first heard it. So uh, when um, COVID was first announced, it was, uh, we were extremely worried that it would be a SARS virus of the type that we had previously seen, as in SARS-1 and MERS. Now, the, the, the mortality rate of SARS-1, again, because of this same viral pneumonia, which had a much higher incidence and was much, much more uh, um, uh, tenacious and, and much more white, uh, prevalent, if you like, in, in the pa patients who had it, was perhaps 10 or 12 percent. And in MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, it had a mortality rate of an incredible 80 percent. So you can imagine if this virus had that kind of mortality. This is a far more infectious virus than those. It's got a far lower mortality than those. But because it's more infectious, because it's traveled further, because it hasn't killed all of its hosts, it's actually a far greater healthcare emergency. So I was perturbed when the government said it was uh, no longer an HCID. It meant several things. It meant to me um, that they didn't have to provide the same levels of um, a PPE, a personal protective equipment, the same levels of preparation in the hospital. They were accepting that it was going to, at that stage, run throughout the population. HCIDs have to be notified and certain measures have to be taken by law. And that removed the government's obligation to do so. It doesn't mean that it's not a very serious problem. Uh, they say they will do it. And if you read carefully, they've done it in, in, in response to the fact that it has a much lower mortality. And we still don't absolutely know the true mortality because we still don't know absolutely how many people have had the virus and therefore absolutely how many who've died. I think both the numbers who've died and the numbers who've had it will be far in excess of the numbers we know. But in terms of the population we've studied well, I think it's likely to be in excess of 1% mortality, perhaps as high as 1.5. And when the cases become very prevalent, very widespread, when when hospital system and health systems are overwhelmed, as we saw in Italy in the first wave that's finally induced us to do something about it, uh, as well as the uh, economic crash, of course, as we're seeing now when the NHS again is being overwhelmed. And I'm afraid more and more people who will turn up to hospital and be in need of intensive care treatment, we'll find that those beds are simply unavailable. And with the best will in the world, no matter what anyone wants to do, the mortality rate will increase because that best treatment for all people will not be available. So that's the problem we're facing. So it very much is a global health pandemic. It very much is a real problem. But you're right, the government did change its uh, classification um, partly in response to more information becoming clear about it, and partly because it wasn't quite in the same category uh, as the other viruses, the feeler viruses, the Ebola viruses, the viruses which literally, if you catch them, you're much more likely to die than survive. We know that's not the case with this virus, and that's partly why controversy continues to rage around it. And there's a group of people who still just don't can't accept that it's real because they've had it and they've been fine, or so many people that they know have had it and seem to be fine, or some people have it and are asymptomatic. That doesn't mean it's got a very wide spectrum of presentation, a wide spectrum of severity. But this is absolutely a global um, uh, epidemic uh, and a problem that the world is facing, the likes of which I've not known in my lifetime and we haven't known in several generations, George. Andy, thanks for the call. Liam is in Belfast. Go ahead, Liam. Hi, George. Thanks for taking the call, mate. Um, Dr. Brar, I, I was on a couple of weeks ago and I honestly wish you were Prime Minister. I, I, you know, Me too. Don't <laughs> you know, what you're talking about. I just, I, I, this is probably more of a political point, George, you may want to comment on, but as far as Boris Johnson goes, how is this guy still the Prime Minister? This has been an absolute catastrophe for 
our country, Trump in America, at least he's going soon, but we, thousands of people dying every day. Why have we made such a bad job of this? I don't understand how it could be such a catastrophe. Doctor, uh, you've said so many times before, but briefly, say so again. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. It, it is a catastrophe. I mean, I, I, it's very hard for me to, to think about your previous poll, George, and see which minister I think is more incompetent. Uh, those who are uh, depriving our children of, uh, of of schooling, not knowing how, you know, how to set up algorithms um, that deliberately have working class children demoted several grades and those who go to uh, the best private schools added several grades uh, versus Matt Hancock. Essentially, these people are in the process of privatizing every public service. Uh, they're in the uh, business of giving out the most money they can to their cronies. They're in the process of absolutely looting uh, the British state rather than, and it's the, absolutely everything is centered around that, the economy, um, rather than looking after the health and well-being of the working population. You saw that so clearly when Marcus Rashford, you know, was the person who shamed them into thinking it might be necessary to spend a few pounds feeding hungry children of the poorest section of the working class when they're absolutely devoted to spending hundreds of billions of taxpayers' money on the very wealthiest companies. I'm afraid this is not something new, but the pandemic is highlighting it. And it's something which is really an urgent call. Why is there no political opposition of a size capable of challenging uh, these people. They feel so secure because the Labour Party, I'm sorry to say, have absolutely failed in any kind of duty to even hold them to account, let alone provide a viable opposition. And it's high time that this country had a workers' party, a party of working people, to put these questions and to create. It's only a political threat that can worry them. It's the same thing with the NHS. They don't care about anything other than a direct threat to their well-being. When there's a, a strong grassroots local campaign that unites healthcare workers with the local population demanding an end to privatization, a reversal of privatization, uh, that's the only thing that's effective. And I'm afraid it's not just health. This runs throughout the running of our economy, of our nation, and indeed our world. So I think this is the task which urgently we need to set before us, George. Thank you, Dr. Bra. Thank you, Liam, in Belfast. The poll, which cabinet minister is the most incompetent? If we had another category saying all of the above, that would definitely be winning. Uh, a, Pretty Patel, 22%. B, Gavin Williamson, 43%. C, Matt Hancock, increasing to 35%. Let's take a one-minute break. Then... My good friend, Marco Cash on Bobby Wine, the opposition leader in Uganda. Quick break. Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Want to know how international issues fit into local ones and how local issues fit into international ones with the historical context to tie them together? Well, we're bringing it to you all by any means necessary. Tune in weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to hear me, Jackie Lukeman, alongside my co-host, Sean Blackman. By any means necessary, your guide to connecting the social, political, and economic movements shaping the world around us. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. talk shows join our faculty of legends contributors and callers everyone is welcome now my good friend marco cash is in touch with his good friend bobby wine or at least he normally is it's not so easy right now because bobby had the temerity to stand to be president of the country of uganda a country that has had quite a checkered line of leaders idi amin uh, being the most infamous. But I'll tell you, the current president, Museveni, should be, if anything, even more infamous. Anyway, he's just won his sixth presidential term with 58% of the vote. Problem for him is nobody in Uganda and nobody in Africa except those that are like him 
actually believes it. Let's hear from Marco Cash. Marco, thanks for calling. Mar um, Marco? Yes? What has happened in Uganda? Well, before I go into the Uganda story, I would like to go into... Uh, uh, I have had the privilege of being to 32 of the 54 countries in Africa. And Africa is... Uh, can you hear me, George? Yeah, of course. The whole world's listening. Right. Okay. I had the privilege to meet a guy with a kind of jovial name of Yama Jama, who was pre predecessor of a com country called the Gambia. Now, I met this guy, and this guy, I heard the phrase when he was trying to borrow some money from the World Bank, and it was an Australian guy, and his name escapes me, which is probably quite favorable, and he was bullying this guy called Yama Jama, who was a despot of the Gambia. And he said to this guy, and I will remember this for the rest of my life, he said to this despot of the Gambia, any man that sits on a seat that's made of guns or knives is a very uncomfortable seat to sit on. Now, George, I think you and your persuasive and international renown is the only man that can put this forward for Uganda for the simple reason. You are or were, I didn't fancy you uh, uh, several years ago, but I think you were before your time. No gangster wants to be a gangster. They weren't born gangsters. They beat up the big boy. And then they got lieutenants. Then when they got what they want to do, then they want to retire. But it's impossible for a gangster to retire. And that's because what most of any is, isn't it? Correct. And also, these, George, you have got a platform just now to be the first guy to come up with a solution. To well, make yeah, the solution is that that we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be facilitating, we shouldn't be colluding with, we shouldn't be supporting, as we are, the absurd proposition that Museveni won 58% of the vote. George, we all know that Bobby Wine won this vote. Now, you're a man of reason. You're a man of reason. You are in a position to come up with a guarantee that this man can resign and not be prosecuted. Yeah, well, there, I'm always up for that. Uh, I, I, if I was in charge of the Foreign Office, that's what I'd be working on. I'd be saying, look, I know why you're staying on, because right. you fear you'll end up behind bars. So what about if I can negotiate a solution whereby you don't go to jail, but you leave Thank the you. presidential palace. Thank you. Um, this no, is what's needed. Just we're, no we're short of time. We're, we're, we're short. Yeah, no I know. I, I, I'm up for that. Marco, we're short of time. Where is Bobby Wine right now? How much danger is he in? Well, his brother has been arrested. His whole campaign party has been uh, uh, imprisoned. His house is surrounded. He is now starving of food. He can't have food. They won't allow him out. And an international journalist who went to visit him has been beaten up and is in hospital in Uganda. Wow. Tell us something about your mate, Bobby Wine, because a lot of people will be hearing his name tonight for the first time, Marco. Yes. Well, Bobby Wine is, was a famous singer... Liken him with um, a, a boy band who got popularity through the clubs, then went into politics. Sorry, I can't hear you, George. No, that's it. Keep going. So, uh, he, he got the youth support. Museveni, um, uh, uh, who, who only got to power, actually, last term, he was out of age. 
and rewrote the constitution he of Uganda. He rewrote it, yeah. It's not Re only... Ripped, it's, ripped, it's, it, ripped it up yeah. and rewrote it. What age is he now? President for life. What age is he, Marco? 76 years, or 77 years of age. So he was supposed to give up when he was 75, right? Yes, yes, but he tore up for the... Uh, he's 76 years of age. He ripped up the constitution and rewrote it, saying he's there for life. Now... I, the, the, the problem Bobby Wine has got is if he gets any sport from the West, most of any brings in the old, oh, colonial cards. Ah, we don't want any more uh, 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 influence from the colonials. But we have a duty of care with what we left behind. Well, we had a great president. I knew him well. Uh, Milton Obote was a great president of Uganda, and we helped to overthrow him uh, and put Idi Amin in. Can you believe it, Marco? We're out of time. Uh, do become our Uganda correspondent. Bring us up to date next week, if you will, on what has happened uh, if, to if, the leader if, of the if opposition. Uganda will open up the internet and let him speak. Yeah, they've closed the internet, they've shut down his phone, they've arrested his brother, they've surrounded his house, They've arrested his party campaigners and they've now beaten up a Western journalist. What's not to love? Thanks for that, Marco Cash, on Bobby Wine. Let's hear from George in Cardiff. Go ahead, George. Hi, George. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, I'm very, very against uh, the way that censorship is going, um, especially with what's happening after the Capitol Hill riot. Yeah. Um, I actually ended up getting deplatformed from Twitter myself. Um, it happened originally quite a while back. Um, and, yeah, they never actually explained why. So whenever I see all these people saying, oh, well, they're only going after the right-wingers, they're only going after the fascists, you know, that, that's absolutely ludicrous. Because, as you know, leftist accounts have been being deplatformed all the time. And all that's going to happen is they're just going to ramp that up even more and just say, well, it's part of our clampdown on domestic terror. Yeah, but, I mean, you can't really, you can't really sell that forever, can you? I mean, wh why were you deplatformed? You're not a, an international terrorist. No, I mean, to be honest, the only thing that I can think was that I'd originally posted a link to that Hunter Biden story, the New York Post one. Yeah, um, which then, the FBI are now acknowledging uh, they are investigating. Yeah, and that's the ludicrous thing. Uh, basically, since that, they've just been limiting my account more and more. And then, you know, even though I hadn't done anything controversial, they just ended up removing me from there. They removed me from Facebook. And I'm sat here thinking, I'm just a guy in Cardiff. You know, I, I'm not like some powerful, influential figure. And so if they, you know, they're, they're just going to go after anybody they want to. And it doesn't matter, you know, what the actual consequence is, what that person has done. It's just going to be showing a message of, you know, we are going to shut you up if you're going to be dissenting. You need a telegram channel. George, thanks for the call. Zoya is in Rhode Island. Who wouldn't go to Rhode Island if they could? Zoya, welcome. Hi, how are you? Good. So I was calling because a, a co-worker of my husband's had raised the point that with all the security in D.C., with 20,000 National Guard troops, somebody's expecting trouble. Yes. And so he's very <laughs> concerned. And at first I sort of was like, oh, no, it'll be fine. But then I remembered I worked for a man who had been a brigadier general in the National Guard, and during the Obama years, he and another uh, general from the National Guard had been very old friends, and their friendship fell apart during the Obama years. So then all of a sudden I went, oh, my gosh, the National Guard units making up that 20,000 are from all over the country. Yeah. So we've got a lot of men with guns who may or may not be Trump supporters. Uh, well, that's like, a possibility, yeah. Well, I was wondering if anybody is vetting them because you, uh, you know, if you know, you had like the Air Force veteran who was part of the Capitol riot mob. Yeah. So There's, there I'm was like, actually a high percentage of the rioters who were either serving or former police officers, National Guard, even Army vets. 
Yeah, and so I'm I'm like I, I'm hoping that they are in fact vetting them and making sure that they're sending people who are very uh, you know responsible and pacific. But well, I've it, never it had a high opinion on that. Our, 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 it suddenly occurred to me the coworker was right that you know this could be really dangerous. I've never had a high opinion of your National Guard, Zoya. Not since the Kent State Massacre, when they shot down all those students protesting against the Vietnam War. That's how old I am. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, they did a good job with the BLM protests for the most part. They, they were better than the local cops. But as I said, it was like, you know, given how heightened everybody is right now, very emotional. Um, you know, as I said, mean, it's like, isn't that from all over the country? Does anybody know who they're sending? Well, good point. It's a very good point that you've raised. Uh, and we may have cause next Sunday to pick over that. Uh, now, uh, the, the point I made right at the beginning of the show, Zoya, if you need mm -hmm. 21,000 soldiers to guard your inauguration, your presidency is not getting off to the best of starts. Is that point being uh, taken on board amongst American public opinion? Um, I am in a very pro-Biden state. Uh, Rhode Island tends to vote Democrat by a margin of at least 67 percent every presidential election. Yeah. So I don't think that people are really grasping it. They like the show of force and that knowing that theoretically there won't be any problem. And that theoretically, any, yeah. Trump, any, any, any Trump supporter will be dealt with immediately. But as I said, it occurred to I me that I think the Trump supporters people... will uh, will probably concentrate on state capitals, don't you? Um, well, only in the states where they'd probably be more likely to be pro-Trump anyway. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I have a feeling they're looking in the wrong place rather than the center of D.C. Zoya, thanks for the call. Uh, Michael is in Minneapolis, and he's always worth listening to. Michael, go ahead. Hey, George, good to, good to talk to you today, as always. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I sort of want to talk about the way the ruling elite in, in, in the United States sort of controls people and sort of uh, the sort of a transition that's happened just in my young lifetime. You know, when I was a boy, I'm just old enough to remember uh, when the media jumped all in on George W. Bush, were huge cheerleaders for him because, you know, Al Gore wanted to update the energy grid and George W. Bush was going to go to war. And so, you know, he was their preferred candidate right up to the Supreme Court held, giving him an assist. Yep. And what I've seen that's been sort of alarming in the last five years is it seems that the ruling elite has sort of switched. And, you know, between, uh, you know, the Russia conspiracy and now, I'd say, but especially now with the idea uh, of this sort of tech censorship and this idea we're going to crack down on domestic terrorism – which is terrifying because that makes you think that the war on terror is going to come home, as many of us, and I'm sure, George, I know you always feared that it would. But the Democrats are really showing their priorities in a strange way. So George B or uh, Joe Biden, excuse me, uh, promised that if, you know, if, if we elected the two senator uh, candidates in Georgia, that the, all of American, all Americans would get $2,000 checks as soon as he got in office. Yeah, where is that no check? No sooner have they won that election. What? Where is the check? Is it in the post? <laughs> it's not yet, but no sooner had they won the election, but Joe Biden said, oh, actually, Trump already gave you 600, so we're only going to give you 1,400 now, <laughs> which seems like a really good way to just irritate all of your voters. Yeah, for, 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 you. for the voted, sake you know, of 600, yeah. Yeah, they managed to elect two Democratic senators in Newt Gingrich's state, which was a minor miracle, and they did it on – on that promise, and then you look at you know the our you know our our allies theoretically the progressives in Congress the squad they shut down forced the vote they weren't willing to extract anything from Nancy Pelosi not a vote on Medicare for all not increased stimulus they weren't willing to demand anything of her to vote for her for Speaker of the House but now they're going all in on an impeachment that almost certainly won't work won't work with as many Republicans as there are in the Senate. So I'm wondering, George, I think this is, you know, it's been hard enough. We haven't had much success sort of protesting against the ruling elite in this country. But I do think, you know, the corporate media is at this point in such lockstep with the Democratic Party. I'm sort of alarmed because, you know, generally from the left is where you see, you know, 
progressive ideas that advance. And it seems like the oligarchs have figured out that if we can get the Democratic voters on our side, it doesn't necessarily matter as much with the Republicans because the Democratic vote party is much closer to the corporate media in this country. And I guess I'm wondering if you could speak to, you know, how we sort of fight against this kind of repressive technocratic oligarch, you know, this, the letting big tech cracking down on. Well, the that's, uh, you know, yeah. no- uh, I mean, uh, big tech is not just in the door. It's sitting on the sofa in the Oval Office. A big tech. Yeah. Uh, has never been closer to political power in the United States than it will be in this, uh, in this uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris era. And we already see what that means. It means that big tech will close down uh, the critics of the political power uh, that they are in bed with. And uh, in the first instance, it's the critics from the right But anyone on the left who doesn't imagine uh, that they will be next is is actually an idiot, is actually a fool. I I agree with you, George, but I just I guess I'm wondering how do we how do we get left leaning voters to understand that? Because I'm telling you that the, the base of the Democratic Party, people who consider themselves progressive, people who consider themselves leftist are cheering on. As the you know, as the tech giants crack down on speech, and uh, and are hoping that there's a harsh crackdown on domestic terrorism, not realizing that if they yes, of course, I don't want to see you know what happened at the Capitol happen anymore, but I also you know don't want to see. I we just watched Black Lives Matter protesters. I was one of them get our heads cracked in all summer and fall, and you can't imagine that's going to get anything but worse, is it? No, it, it, it's going to get worse, and anybody who thinks that. Uh, cheering on or supporting uh, anti-democratic maneuvers is going to stop at one person to the right of him uh, is, uh, is, as I say, a fool. I've got to press on, Michael, alas, because Mike is in the Bahamas. Even more enticing. Go ahead, Mike. Hey, George, how are you? Good, sir, good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Well, like, like Zoya, I was born in the state of Rhode Island. But uh, that's not why I called. Mm. Um, I think the Democrats really have to go after and impeach Trump. Well, uh, uh, not it's saying, up to the Republicans the, now, yeah? They've yes, already well, impeached him. That, well, they impeach, but actually um, have it um, formalized so he Convicted, his, yeah. Um, he has to be convicted yeah, his, by a two-thirds majority his, uh, pension in the Senate. And, that's not going to uh, happen, Mike. Service protection. It's not going to get well, 66 saying, votes, is it? You're saying it's not going to happen and not doing and doing nothing. Well, what's the whole point of that? We have to try. Also, certain people like Lauren Boebert tweeted uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, location to the rioters. She should go to prison. Now, this is you know, if she tweeted this. There's a record of it. You, you can't re- even if you remove a tweet, it's still there. Yeah, sure, yeah. What did she so, say in that uh, tweet? What did, what did she say in that tweet? How specific about her location? She said, she said her location. That I don't know, but apparently this is what I've heard, and if it's true, it, it can be proved or disproved. Mm. Well, uh, that's, so a very that serious, one, that's a very serious matter, if and true. And it seems, it seems that uh, there was a fifth column in the Capitol with certain Congress people. Well, and again, I, I if read that, can that be proved, they I, have to yeah, be removed. I, I read that, but um, a lot of these things are being walked back now, Mike. Uh, you best not get caught when the wind change. Uh, the 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 charge of the man with the Glock, uh, for example, has been released and cleared. He he was actually in there on state business with his Glock. Uh, a lot of the uh, stories about assassination. Uh, and hanging and so on are now all being walked back because law enforcement is telling the political class that actually there's no evidence to support these things. Well, if they're true and uh, they were stupid enough to send out tweets or any type of electronic communication, it can be verified. What do you say, Mike, to the argument that... uh, these maneuvers are merely going to deepen and sharpen uh, the 
very dangerous divisions in the U.S. Well, how come when Republicans are on the attack, they, they never seem to care about that? No, they, but they I'm asking you, That's Mike, in the Democrat. Bahamas, a liberal. I'm asking you, Mike, a Bahamas, liberal and Democrat. What do you think about the danger of that? Um, I think it's overstated. The, the country's divided anyway. Uh, we might as well see this thing tr through, or else someone's going to do it again. Okay, that's one point of view, Mike. I'm glad to have uh, platformed you in making it. Let's hear of Richard in Clarksville. Uh, feels the same. Go ahead, Richard. Hello, George. Um, I'd like to talk about the, the future of the Republican Party. I think January 6th was bigger than people are, I mean, of course it was huge, but people, it's even bigger than many people are thinking, especially Republicans uh, not in the Trump cult, who I think are in quite a bit of denial and don't really realize how much this, this hurts them. I think a, a historical guide after the Civil War, the party of the Confederacy at that time was the Democrats, and they were punished for about 75 years. Uh, really closer to a century, that they were not really relevant in national elections. And I think there's an analogy here that, uh, you know, seeing the Confederate flag with white supremacists parading through the Capitol, uh, I think the, uh, the, the Republican Party, of course now it's the Republican Party that is the party of the Confederacy, I think they will be punished for a generation. And it gets even worse when you have Mitch McConnell wanting to purge Trump from the party well, that is going to splinter the party. The, uh, the, those 50 million, I don't know how many, let's say 30, 40, 50 million Trump cult supporters, they, they are gone if the Republican Party at the top wants to purge them. And already Trump overnight lost uh, 10% in, in approval down to 31%. That 10% drop, I think, represents uh, 10, 20 million maybe um, uh, establishment Republicans at the top. So the Republican Party is in disarray. I mean, you know it's in disarray. I think it's much more serious than people are giving credit for. And I have so many things to go to here. Uh, I, really, I really don't agree with, uh, with, with getting rid of or uh, saying Trump can't run anymore. Uh, and the way that works, George, just to clarify that, they first have to do the two-thirds conviction in the Senate. And at, if they do that, they're able, with a, fi a, a simple 50% vote, declare they can't run for office anymore. But what's the point if somebody is convicted of, of, uh, of uh, um, impeachment? It should be a moot point. That they shouldn't be able to run any. I mean, they shouldn't be able to successfully do anything anyhow. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this uh, is just but a he'll just find someone else to run as his surrogate. And that someone else might be even more dangerous. Richard, thanks for the call. I've got to clear the decks because there's a legend on the line. It's Norma in Bristol. Last call of the night. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. This is just a lighter note. Yes, we um, always need that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I enjoyed listening to um, John Stracy's interview. Very interesting, um, yeah. Now, um, I listen to the boxing on the radio and not the TV because I don't like seeing blood. But I asked myself, why do I like it? You see, I actually don't like violence, but the reason I think that I do like it is because it gets rid of the anger within me in a civilized way. I wrote that down because um, I do enjoy listening to the boxing and... Uh, that was my one point, actually. Well, I was a boxer, and uh, I agree with you. Uh, it is... Uh, humans are uh, naturally aggressive, uh, males more so. It's a good thing to let your aggression out mm -hmm. in, a, in a disciplined, rules-based yeah. sport like boxing. I've always defended boxing for that reason. Well, I do like Anthony Joshua, actually, when you said you don't like you know, if you're not too keen on some of the future ones. Um, but the other thing I really wanted to mention was Eric Levy. I thought he was marvellous. Wasn't he? 92 oh, years young. I know. He brought tears to my eyes, you know, because um, he, he was so up to date with everything that was going on. And then he mentioned our beloved Paul Robeson. And I thought, what a man, you know. <laughs> he is a, a marvellous man. I've known him for a very long time. He was a big supporter of my efforts 
30 years ago to um, break the stranglehold that uh, the um, Western countries had on Iraq to try and yeah. stop the sanctions, yeah. stop the war, of course. I mean, yeah. he's completely indefatigable and selfless. He seeks yeah. nothing. You may have noticed, I had to force him to talk about his own arrest. Well, that is true. And I mean, he was so up together. I'm not being um, patronizing because I'm 83 soon. But I, I shan't last that long. But Yes, you is, will. You'll no, be no, no, on no, the no. show, God willing, <laughs> when you are 92. And everyone will be saying she's so articulate and wholehearted about everything she talks about. Thanks, uh, for that, Norma, in Bristol. Alas, it is time to go. I hope, like me, uh, you've enjoyed the show. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was also for you. And if it was, come back next week at the same time, same place. Bring another viewer or listener with you. Why don't you?